Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all doing well, and welcome to the top eight of today's tournament. This is uh, these are the individuals who made it to the uh, to essentially round of eight. Uh, we did have, I think, fourteen teams today that signed up. So this is just going to be the top eight, and we're going to be casting every single one of these matches. And the team names will be displayed in the actual uh, battles, but for the sake of uh, this, we just kind of labeled them by their grand alliances. So this format is the grand alliance format. So how it works is you can't just put Empire together with Chaos, right? Uh, all of the alliances that the players are playing in, with the exception of the elves, are basically um, thematic alliances. So, for example, if we look at the very top, order is going to be, you know, order tied stuff. So it's Empire, it's Bretonia, Destruction is the Greenskins, it's the Ogre Kingdoms. I believe we also put the Beastmen in with them as well. So they have a couple of options as well. Uh, Chaos Undivided, we had to split up Chaos. Um, Chaos is split up into two two or three factions, I think. Yeah, two. So you have Chaos Undivided, which is Warriors of Chaos, Skaven, Beastmen, Norska, and Demons of Chaos. And then Mark Chaos is all the different Chaos gods. So that's going to be Nurgle, Korn, Slaanesh, and Zeech. So they can't, like, you can't mix Chaos Undivided with the marked uh, gods. So um, that's just how we had to do to balance it. Because otherwise they would just be stronger than everyone else. And they already probably are stronger than everybody else, but uh, it's quite nice. We have two undead factions playing on the bottom side. Chaos Undivided playing against Marked Chaos. So only one order faction did make it through. We had a couple more order factions, but most of them did get karate chopped in the uh, earlier rounds. So we're going to see if our order faction today is going to be able to kind of get going here. But um, yeah, no no one signed up with the Elvish Alliance. There was a team that had, had High Elves and Lizardmen, which was the um, Order Tide is split into two. We have the Western Order Tide and the Eastern Order Tide. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm just going to put order tie for the sake of this, but, um, cause they're the only ones that are left. All right. Yeah. Love how you made it. So you can't take Nurgle and Bellacor. That was one of the big reasons because <laughs> I didn't want Bellacor getting heals. I thought that would just be broken. And, you know, chaos is already so strong that we had to kind of, you know, make it a little bit more fair, but that's the basic format. Um, all the matches are best of one domination mode, two V two. And you know, I, I think Domination's really a, a solid, solid format for 2v2. It's 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 really fun. I Professor Pone and I played today. We did lose our game, but we, we had an absolute blast trying to make the uh, the Empire Cathay combo work. And I'll be putting that replay up at a later date, but for today, we're going to be focusing on the top eight as well. So first match of the day, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and switch it on over and have some fun. It is going to be the Forces of Order. So this team name is the uh, Master and Good Dogecoin. And they're facing off against the Badland Baddies. So those are the two teams playing here. The Master and Good Dogecoin is Kark and the True Bretonian. So these are the two champions hailing from uh, Korea. And they're going to be facing off against the dreaded Flying Taco, the, the Ogre Legend, who's going to be teaming up with the one and only Gojira. Gojira is going to be leading the forces of the Greenskins here in our first match. And Eric, thank you so much for the donation. Kicking off the stream. Really, really appreciate that, my friend. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys are ready. Let's see how this goes. Now, on the other side here, the Bretonians are going to be teaming up with the Wood Elves. I actually really like this combo. I think it's pretty cool. Looks like the true Bretonians are going to be coming in with Knights of the Realm uh, with the Fane Chantress and a bunch of pole arms. Obviously expecting some mass coming in from the enemy army. And, you know, these guys, worst case, do have 40 melee defense against some of the Greenskin infantry. So they can hold their own. Now, it is going to be four Way Watchers from Kark. So Kark has four Way Watchers. And this is probably one of my favorite elements of this as well. He has Chad Gibson. So Orion is coming in. And, uh, dude, I can't remember the last time I saw Orion, but he's got all his goodies. He's got the Horn of the Wild Hunt. He's got the Hawk's Talon, Hounds of Orion. This is uh, this is really fun. And the true Bretonian is going to be coming in with the Fane Chantress. This is a very thematic one as well. I mean, Wood Elves and Bretonia in lore, uh, if I'm not mistaken, definitely have a bit of a strange, strange kind of relationship. But they can work together from time to time, I would imagine, against the bad boys. So... Very, very thematic stuff as we see the demigod of uh, Athel Lauren charging with the Fane Chantress uh, side by side. On the other side, we got two factions who are just wanting to do some crumping. You know, the ogres probably using the greenskins to get more food. They're like, hey, you know, there's a fight over there. If you help us fight, we'll get you guys to fight and you get us the food. It's just, it's a win-win for everybody. So that's basically what's going down. But for Taco, it's going to be the dreaded Noblar Trappers with the not gold chevrons. We got Kreese's gold tooth backed up by the snow, the snow horn of Morn, the sky striders again, one of the other specials here from the flying taco, a bunch of orc biggins and orc boys for Gojira and Go Gojira also coming in with Azag as well. So Azag with the Spirit Leech and Buna. Both are very good against Bretonia. You just want to be spamming Buna on like Knights of the Realm and things like that. But you're about to see the dreaded Micro coming in from the Bretonians as we are going to be getting the Knights of the Realm. Uh, starting to hammer into some of the Orc boys. Going to be looking for some freebies here. Trying to plow some of these Orcs. And uh, without the Ogre Heavy Cap support, honestly, the true Bretonian might be able to really wreck these guys. And the Waywatchers already got a big and unsummoned. 
So the three Waywatchers sitting here from Kark were able to blast one of those units. And the Britannia Knights are, oh my god, they're having a field day! Gojira's orcs here are getting pounded super hard, and the Ogre Kingdoms are finally coming to help. But if you guys haven't seen the true Bretonian play, he's probably the best best Bretonian player in the entire community. Very, very strong. And uh, yeah, his cab micro is, is pretty legendary for sure. And you can see he's basically just slam jam space jamming in. But Gojira does get a very nice response here. He does get the smoke bomb activated on the Knights of the Realm with some Spider Rider. So they might be able to drag down this unit. And they do respond with a fade up unit as well. So it looks like the initial charging from the true Bretonian was very strong. But there is a little bit of counterplay now coming against Sky Striders here being heavily focused by the Waywatchers. So we see the triple Waywatcher right here. And they are shooting into the Sky Striders downtown and doing some really, really big damage for sure. Now, another reinforcement coming in. Kark going to be bringing his own calf. He does have the, the glorious Lost Sylvan Knights, which is very good because Greenskins and Ogre Kingdoms are both a little bit lacking in, like, kind of... I mean, they do have Spirit Leech from Azag, but aside from that, like, magic damage units aren't super prevalent on their rosters, right? Or existing. Lost Sylvan Knights get a big charge, and a lot of these orcs are going to be terror routed. You can see the Christmas Cab doing some serious, serious damage. As the Waywatchers are basically just sitting in a unit of fours, we see some Ogre Bulls trying to sneak by. So Flying Taco trying to penetrate into the backfield with these Ogre Bulls. Might be able to catch some of the Waywatchers, we'll have to see. But that's a really strong combo, right? Like if somebody wants to get into your backfield, they're going to have to face the Lances of Bretonia as the Knights of the Realm, or these Knights Errant, a little bit hard to tell here. Um, Knights Errant, still that's enough charge damage to really wreck those Ogre Bulls. It comes in and peels for those Elven Archers. Now on this side, we see a little bit of a fight going down. The Bretonian Cab are forced back, but Orion, the Demigod of the Forest, absolutely dominating the Snowhorn of Morn. Is he going to be throwing a Javelin? Oh, hell yeah, dude. Here we go. So throwing a Javelin right into the back of the Snowhorn. And the Javelin does have pretty good uh, armor and piercing, so it is able to actually break this unit. Yeah, negative nine leadership, and the Snowhorn is broken. So more Bretonian cavalry cycling about. We do have two Bretonian cab units hammering, in hammering into the forces of destruction, whereas on the other side, we do see the objective being held by Flying Taco and Gojira pretty efficiently. But defenders of Flair to Lee, the Lost Sylvan Knights, definitely causing a little bit of havoc. Greasus actually does the magic damage, so if Greasus can get on top of the Sylvan Knights, he can do some work. But the Way Watchers are melting Greasus. He's getting absolutely pounded by this right now. Absolutely brutal. Look at that. 15 leadership, 2,500 HP. Kark is moving in, and he's basically just like the Dak. He's just all the Daka, right? While Bretonia just sweeps and hammers and makes sure nothing gets into the backfield and causes, you know, serious havoc. But Greasus could be going down here, and I love that Flying Taco brought Greasus. And to be clear, um, Flying Taco and Gojira did win their first round matchup. Of course, today we're just casting the round of eight because the, uh, the games are pretty long in this format. So Greasus Goldtooth is buckled. Negative 27 leadership. Probably going to be shattering here. The Bretonian front line's holding well. They have the Beast Slayers of Bastone, Knights Errant here, Fane Chantress, Mortis. And Orion is also a really good counter. You know, this is interesting. Seeing Orion being brought against, like, all these large ogres and monsters, he's a really good anti-large character. Like, if you put Orion against, like, and, like the Stonehorns, the Butchers, uh, Sky Striders, like, he's going to be trading pretty well into them. And the Fane Chantress Mortis Engine helps to clear out the Noblars and the Greenskin Supporting Infantry. More Knights Errant penetrating into the backfield against the Orc War Boys. Probably going to be losing these fight. Flying Taco with a very nice maneuver here, moving across with the Sky Striders to kind of intercept the forces of good. Currently looking at the value done, it looks like the forces of uh, of the true Bretonian and Kark, the Order Tide here, is up by a pretty substantial amount of value. But again, there is some healing on the Ogres, but Wood Elves have healing and so too do the Bretonians. So it's not really going to be like an inherent advantage for them. On this side, Bad Boys still holding on to the point. Orc Boys doing it. And they are holding on to the double cap for quite some time. Currently, they do have 379 to 136 here. But those Way Watchers are just really, really putting a ton of pressure on, and it's probably only a matter of time before the Orion and Fae Enchantress combo are able to move onto the objective here and take this. We'll have to see, but really, really cool combos from these two players. It's definitely quite a bit of fun to see. I, you know, most of the factions that signed up, the two most popular, the hands down most popular was Chaos. The Chaos uh, Undivided and Chaos uh, Marked were the most popular factions we had signed up, but also the next was Order Tide, but pretty much all the Order Tide lost in the first round except the uh, except this team. <laughs> they were able to get there. Chaos pretty much crushed through. So, Lost Sylvan Knights plowing, causing big terror routes. We do have the Knights of the Realm, uh, obviously very, very good here, and Questing Knights mixed in. Oh, okay, so there's no Knights of the Realm here, but Questing Knights have good armor piercing, pretty good fighters, and Knights, of, Knights Aaron are just a great piece. They With the, the Lance bonus, they have a charge bonus of 76, which is actually really, really steep, but it looks like this objective is going to be flipping to the forces of order. There's also a big tide of, uh, of spears coming in, so these Orc Biggins are surrounded by a bunch of Eternal Guard here from Karku. Definitely needs to get some cab to come in and hammer these guys from the back so he can move up and take that objective. You know, if, if you get, give them too much time, they can certainly get you. Buna going down to the back. 
On top of the Lost Silver Knights, very, very nice, but Silver Knight's going to be attacking the Snowhorn of Morn, which is going to be getting the Glacial Defense, giving it a lot of armor, but these Ethereal units do have 100% armor piercing. And the Waywatchers are able to kind of pull this giant beast back and get a little bit of Daka going down as well. More Saber Tusks coming in from Flying Taco. Very, very good backline harass here. But it looks like the backline harass is going to be folded up. The combination of having, like, look at this. Like, the synergy between these two players is really good. Anytime there's a backfield threat to the Wood Elves, like, just some erect Bretonian knights come out. The true Bretonian just summons the knights errant with the lances and gets in there and just butchers these guys, which is... I really, really love seeing that synergy. I think it's a really cool comp. It's not one that really came to mind, but, um, yeah, certainly a strong synergy. Knights Errant going to be finishing off Saber Tusk. Side objective being reclaimed. The front objective, it's going to be a tough one. Um, it looks like the objective is owned by the forces of order for now, uh, but it is being flipped back to the uh, destruction tide here. Gojira's damage pulling back up, 6.7, so he's almost caught up to the damage value here of the True Bretonian and Kark. Flying Taco, of course, with Greasus uh, getting beaten down earlier is going to be, uh, I'm sure, struggling a little bit. And Taco has also been taking very aggressive engagements, diving, trying to shut down the missiles, which has probably been putting him in more precarious situations because he's taking that burden on his shoulder of trying to get back there. But Bretonian Cab just keep popping out, doing a lot of havoc. And uh, overall, it's looking like the Order Tide is in a slightly commanding position as they do secure the side objective. The Mass Bretonian Cab, the Questing Knights, Knights of the Realm, and more Questing Knights here able to uh, stabilize the point. And Ogre is going to be coming out with bulls, and but the Greenskin army looks to be pretty folded up as well. We see a couple Orc Biggins and some Light Cab, but like just the numerous, numerous Elves and Bretonians all over the battlefield is pretty serious. So Knights of the Realm get a beautiful charge right here, lancing into the uh, exposed bellies here of these Ogres. I mean, they do have the Gut Blades, but not going to save them too much. As we do see Azag the Slaughter coming in, trying to help against the Knights of the Realm. Granted, he might be a little bit vulnerable himself, Spears on the objective, going to be super good. Um, most of the units we see on the side of the battlefield from the Destruction Tide are basically uh, like spear units. So they're going to be very, very tough for the Ogres to remove. And Orion of the Fane Chantress is just causing problems. I wonder how much value we see from Orion so far. He's sitting at 1400 value, which is pretty cool. It's funny how the name is like... The, the replay was um, was sent by the, uh, was sent by the uh, Korean player, so the names are obviously not showing up for me, which is pretty funny. But Knights of the Realm, Lancing down, running into the Ogre Bulls, and a big, big charge there as we do see some Eternal Guard coming out, as well as some Glade Riders. And it really, really does look like the Destruction Tide is going to be pushed back pretty heavily. The Way Watchers are doing a bit of a slow squeeze, and the ammunition conservation we're seeing is so good, right? Like, he doesn't have them on auto-fire. He's manually shooting, you know, the right targets, whether it be like Orc War Boys or Biggins and different things like that. Azag in the backfield trying to peel, but... They're very, very close to being triple caps here. Now, Ogres and Greenskins are pretty good capture weight factions. You know, the cheap Orc Boys and the Biggins have good capture weight in tandem with the Ogre Bulls, so they can certainly bully people off objectives. And you can see it's taking Bretonia a little bit of time to get up, but now they're really pressing super hard as we do see a Searing Doom going down from the forces of Order on top of the Sabertooth packs. Or, eh, it looks like something hit the Butcher of the Great Mob. But yeah, the Fae Enchantress Orion combo seems very, very cool. Yes, there's 2v2 and Domination. It's actually really fun. The, the reason why I haven't done too much of it in the past is because it's very laggy. But today we played the entire tournament offline and I'm just casting it via replays now, which is, I think, the way to do it because it's a great format. I think it's one. Of, it's some of the most fun I've had in a while, to be honest. Uh, Pone and I played a little bit. It was a blast. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing it more. Maybe we'll we'll make it a more common thing. Waywatchers blasting the cab down. Fane Chanter is going to be Mortis Engineering down these biggins and Orion will be coming as well. Looks like he's currently throwing his spear. The Wild Hunt is on. On the other side, Knights of the Realm plowing through units. We see Glade Riders chasing down the scraps in the backfield. Desperate plays as the uh, or Destruction Tide is basically just summoning out of their spawn, which is an opportunity for them to maybe come back, but we'll have to see. Jesus, man, what is that? Oh my god. Look at that. Watched you for years and never been able to catch you live. I owe you this for hours of entertainment, and thanks for everything. Holy shit, man. That's a $500 donation. Oh my god, man. I don't even know what to say. It's going to be hard to finish this game. Thank you so much, man. That is super generous. I don't even know what to say, dude. Thank you. Goddamn. Well, hopefully you're enjoying the 2v2 format, my friend. <laughs> Sweet baby Jesus. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. That is, uh, that is extremely generous, man. I don't know what to say, dude. Thank you. And uh, yeah, man. Wow. That's, that's serious. All right. It kind of took me out of my casting element a little bit there. Thank you so much, man. Sweet baby Jesus indeed. Wow. Wow indeed. The mighty Greasus is, uh, is paying here in chat. I love it. Thank you so much, man. That means a lot. And hopefully you're enjoying this first battle, dude. Hit me up anytime, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm going for sure. It's all good, man. It's all good. So Knights Aaron on the other side, as well as the Treekin continue to battle. And dude, man, I don't know, man. Thank you so much. Jeez, I can't even like get back into it. This, that's, uh, that's just so generous, man. Thank you, thank you. The taco has been crunched, yes. Of course. It is going to be a triple cap here. 
We do see the Treekin as well as the Spellsinger of Life getting in there. And on the other side, we do see a lot of Knights Errants kind of cleaning up the scraps. And it's looking like this game is very much over. But a valiant effort from our... The only players to play Destruction today were Gojira and um, Flying Taco. And they won their first round match against strong opponents and uh, put up a great fight against... You know, players who many consider to be favorites in this tournament uh, with the True Bretonian and uh, Kart coming in. Both are very, very strong players. So, yeah, cheers to them, man. They played Destruction, which I perceive to be one of the weaker alliances so, as, as far as their faction range goes. But they still did very, very good and made it pretty far. So, hey, man. Um, so, Cass, shoot me a message in Discord, man. Lady Turn and I will we'll send We got We got to send you something. We're going to send you, like, a cool custom art piece or something. Yeah, that's just shoot, shoot me a message in Discord, man. We got we got to we got to get you set up. Please. Thank you so much, man. I really, really appreciate that. The Badland Baddies will have their day. Yes, they will. Hey, Inner Flame and Outpost, thanks for becoming members. Greatly appreciate it, guys. The battle rages on here as the Fane Chantress continu continues the Mortis Engine. And Orion is just such a Chad. Look at this giant demigod. I like, I'm, I'm getting a favorite. Like, Orion is one of my favorite characters in Warhammer Fantasy. He is so cool. He's the reason why I think Wood Elves are the coolest. Like, look at this guy. Just getting a spear and battling the Foul Saber Tusk packs. We can do a little bit of fast forwarding here as this game is going to be getting closed out. We do see the uh, forces of destruction fighting back, getting the Fane Chantress, but at this point, even if they did get some ground back, they wouldn't have enough time. So, Inner Flame and Outpost, thank you so much, man. Thank you, thank you. And uh, if we have any mods, you could drop a Discord link in chat. That'd be greatly appreciated. And Cass, go ahead and join there. And again, shoot me a message, man. We got it. We got to set you up for that. Azag coming in for the kill. Gojira getting the last laugh as Azag does swoop in there and takes down his prize. Greasus watching from the hill somewhere, mending his wounds, and uh, and yeah, that's going to be it. What a great game, though. That was really, really fun. I enjoyed that one. The Order and Destruction, the two underdogs, the because they are the underdogs in this format. I think the strongest is probably Chaos, followed by Undead. Undead and Chaos are definitely the strongest alliances, but it's not to say they can't lose in the hands of the right players. Yeah, Destru Destruction does include Dark Elves. It does. It does. Man, one last time, thank you guys so much. Cass, I really appreciate that. Inner Flame and Outpost, thank you guys for becoming members. Makes a world of difference. All right. So, on the other side, let's take a look at the value. Way Watchers, that is a lot of chevrons. Oh, look at that. 2,000 value. 3,000, 1,700, and 1,800. You know what's really, really cool about this? Like this, this the, the Korean team here is like, their builds just synergize so well. It's like, What's the best unit the Wood Elves have in the game, okay? Boom. Bunch of Way Watchers. But he also didn't bring, like, what most people perceive to be the strongest Wood Elf Lord either. And he made it work really well. And then the Bretonian player is like, what's the best Bretonian unit? Probably Knights of the Realm. Let's use them. And, like, just pure efficiency. Just machine-like efficiency. And, you know, I, I, Flying Taco and Gojira, two of my favorite people. I love it. The fact that he brought Chad Greasis against like a missile faction like what else just the most chad play ever and goji's army was badass too azag with the 3600 value man look at that that is amazing biggins also did very very good and looking around here good armies honestly i think they needed um some artillery that would have been pretty good like an iron blaster just sitting back there i don't even know about iron blasters but maybe like some goblin rock lobbers i don't really know i uh, yeah i do like the lead belchers but they they got shut down a little bit but i'm not sure man yeah, the Wood Elves and, and Bretonians make sense from a lore perspective, too. Well, that's the thing, Okoy. We have um, we have alliances, so they have to play certain alliances depending on what team they choose. So, All right, so we're going to get the next game set up here. Let's have some fun. Thank you guys all for joining, and we will be uh, getting rid of that one. So let's go ahead, and that was this match. All right. You guys want to see an Undead Mirror match? <laughs> we'll save that one for a little bit later let's uh let's have a let's have a yeah all right so we have this one because it's like okay okay i'm trying to see which one we want to do so let's go to the brackets next and here and then that is going to be order advancing on order will be facing the winner of uh, chaos undivided and marked chaos here very good hey man great stream so far our, uh we did play pwn and i lost in the earlier rounds we're only showing top eight but there were earlier games taking place we went Empire and um, Bretonia. It was a really, really close game, actually. We just barely lost. It was so close. It was really, really fun, though. All right. So let's get this. And now we will do uh, Mark Chaos of the Gods versus the... Um... Yeah, so I got to get the team names here real quick. Hold up. Okay. There we are. 
Perfect. And um, where is this? Which team are they? Okay, so that is going to be the... Yeah, that looks to be it. Okay, so this one is going to be... War S versus... These next teams are War S versus the uh, Peasant Mobs. <laughs> That's the name of their team. Ironically, they're not playing Bretonia, but their team name is Peasant Mobs. So we'll see how this all unfolds as we load into the match, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining. And I do need to update the nameplate. So it is going to be War S versus Peasant Mobs. Did I not click update? Should have updated. There we go. All right. I need to make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Outstanding. And very good. Hey, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys to the new members here on the channel. Helps keep us rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Yeah, Koi, you should have played, man. We needed a little bit more ogre love in this event. And this is a super casual event. Like it's it's uh it's very, very casual. I love the badass layout for the bracket and the most haggard of fonts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, aesthetics are not my my specialty. That's that's for sure. Um they're not my specialty. <laughs> yeah, that's good, man. Okay, so these maps, um, this is gonna be on the is this the right one? Or they might have they might have played the wrong map. I'm not sure. Let me go ahead and double check this. Hold on. I think they just played the wrong map, which is okay. It's not a huge deal. <laughs> as long as both sides are okay with it, we are good. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be the forces of marked chaos. So, we have Slanesh and Zinch. Now, this is a pretty interesting combo for sure. Uh, you get some really scary infantry. You get good magic support with range support. But again, you're going to be a little bit vulnerable to like artillery. Now, in my experience, uh, one of the best like alliances is Skaven with Warriors of Chaos. I have play tested against it a couple times because Skaven, the weakness is their front line, but they have some of the best range utility via mortars, globideers, Gisales in the entire game, right? Let me just double check something. I feel like I want to make sure I have the right the right um, map here. Yeah, it looks like it's all good. But yeah, it's very nasty. And then you bring like a Warriors of Chaos front line and you can get some really, really good work going. Yeah, this uh, this tournament was on, on Tavern. I announced it in the Discord as well. Yeah, so that's that. Ice Pilgrim says, turn, great format for streaming as, as to leave out the lag from the screen. We hope CA. I don't think CA is ever going to do dedicated servers, honestly. I don't. Like I used to have hope. Um, but yeah, like I, I brought it up so much and it's always just kind of like, eh, you know, I don't get good responses from it. So we, we just have to work with it, man. You know, we have to endure as Sigmar did. So for the Warriors of Chaos Army, to be, well, Chaos has some of the best infantry in the entire game, right? So it's going to be a Warriors of Chaos front line with a Sorcerer of Death as well as Valky the Bloody. And for Skaven, we got the Chieftain combo and it's going to be weapons team. So we have Natty Bubo Sharpshooters, we have Poison Wing Globideers. We do also have a Warlock Engineer with Howling Warp Guild to shut down the Air Force. And for the other side here, for uh, Ghoul's Baby and uh, Fodge here, we do have the uh, Chaos Warriors of Slanesh. We have a War Shrine of Slanesh, which is also a Mortis Engine. Sigvald's going to be marching up, and the Zinchian Hordes of Hell are upon us. Which is going to be quite a bit of fun. But multiplayer campaigns? Yeah, multiplayer campaigns are pretty rough. Um, yeah, they're pretty rough just because of the lag, unfortunately. But it is, it is the price you pay. It is the price you pay. Now, Skaven Army going to be coming up. So, Chaos Undivided versus Marked Chaos. That is the uh, kind of faction range there. We do see the Gisele fire from the Skaven teeing off into the Chaos Source here. Spirit Leech going down as well. Very, very good focus fire from the Skaven and Warriors of Chaos Alliance as they are able to get some nice sniping there. But, you guys, you have to remember, you're having to deal with a Warriors of Slanesh front line. I was thinking, I was really surprised that nobody actually signed up with... Um, nobody signed up with Double Slanesh. I felt like there was going to be some arch villain who just comes in with Double Slanesh today. I was like... Where are they? One of the combos that I thought would be really fun for 2v2 would also be Nurgle and Corn. Imagine having just, oh my god, look at that spell coming in from the Exalted Lord of Change, just nukes those gutter runners. But before I was uh, interrupted by that epic play, uh, what I was going to say is I think one of the cooler combos in the game would be Nurgle and Corn, and just having big Chad Scarbrand and Kugath, and then Kugath is like healing up Scarbrand with like fleshy abundance while he just like rips and tears. That seems like it could be really, really awesome, but who knows? Skaven weapon teams in the back still getting some good value. Uh, we see Skaven slaves being summoned out and the Swords of Chaos from VA here. Look at that. Oh, I love it. Swords of Chaos will definitely be very good against the uh, the Armored Chaos Warriors and also against some of the Zinchian demons and whatnot. Legamas, any Nurgle or Slanesh teams out there? No, um, you totally can too. And you guys should join. We had a lot of players who were, you know, beginners in the earlier rounds playing and uh, hopefully they had fun. I mean, just, yeah, it's a really casual format. It's fun. 2v2 takes a lot less pressure off and oh my God, dude. Oh my god, Legal Chef. 
Cast8228 has inspired me. I am uh, the same, never donated. Watch tons of great content in your birthday. Let's raise the toast. Uh, get yourself a pierogi feast. Gonna have to drive to LA for that, but hey, we can make it happen, dude. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Ah, damn, dude. You guys are too, too generous here. Pit of Shades going down to the back from the Marked Chaos Faction on top of the uh, Poison Wing Globe Ears. Able to get a little bit of a bombardment there. And now we see the Avalanche Mortars from the Skaven thumping damage. And interesting, guys, we got crushed by the Avalanche Mortars. So the uh, Skaven Warriors of Chaos team is actually the team that eliminated Professor Pone and I earlier in the tournament. So, yeah, very, very nasty stuff. Look at the DPS from the Avalanche Mortars. And Legal Chef, thank you again one more time, man. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Hopefully you're enjoying the hot action. Globadier is up in the sky, teeing off into the Chaos Furies. And uh, the Avalanche Mortar is probably going to get compromised by this Air Force here. But the cool part is uh, it's Hellstrider and Hellstrider action. We do get some Hellstriders from the uh, Marked faction moving in and going after the Avalanche Mortars. But immediately going to be intercepted by the Hellstriders of the Warriors of Chaos, which uh, obviously are pretty good as well. So Avalanche Mortars will be back online. But it looks like the frontline objectives are being held by the forces of Marked Chaos. We do see the back objective being held by Slanesh. This one is held by Warriors of Chaos. Uh, they do have some Chosen of Slanesh with Hellscare just coming out. Check that out. Dude, look at the Chosen of Slanesh. How cool are these guys? I love that we're getting to see these like elite units. And look, at, they've literally taken no damage fighting a Devoted Marauder. Like nothing. And just been nibbled on ever so slightly. But this objective is going to be flipping to the forces of Marked Chaos. And it looks like in the backfield, Skaven do stabilize their weapons team. So we do have the Poison Wing Globadiers back online. The Avalanche Mortars. Natty Bubo Sharpshooters. All those bad boys are holding on. And the Swords of Chaos just kind of patrolling the backfields. Making sure nothing's going to be happening back here to our, our friends. And on the other side, we do see Marked Chaos moving up. So the Gods of Chaos trying to punish the Undivided. You know, trying to uh, get them to join their specific ranks. You know how it is with the Chaos Gods. But this objective is going to be flipping to the forces of uh, Marked Chaos, it looks like. Although it is going back down as some Skaven have arrived on the objective. So we do see the double Skaven Slave Tide as well as these Marauders moving up. Might be able to move off these, uh, these, these haggard Blue Horrors. We'll have to see. Chosen still fighting up in the hills. Chosen of Slanesh were brought as a marked unit. So they are a marked unit of the Warriors of Chaos here. Pit of Shades going down to nuke one of the Globadier units. But the Avalanche Mortars, dude, in the game against us, I think their Avalanche Mortars got like 4,000 value or something. Because we had Cathay and Empire and they were just obliterating our, like, our infantry lines. It was so brutal, dude. It was so brutal. Hey, Sieg, dude. Oh my god. Sieg with a $100 donation as well. Dude, you guys, you guys are out of control, man. I don't know what to say. Thank you guys so much. Sieg, man. Oh, my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep these good tournaments flowing, man. The good times shall roll indeed. And a lot of good stuff coming in the horizon. we got Total War, of course, and uh, we'll be covering Company of Heroes, Blood Bowl. Thank you so much, Sieg. I really appreciate that. And uh, let's get let the games begin. So Skaven doing a really good job of taking the side objective here. So we do see the Warlock Engineer as well as the Chieftain grabbing the side objective and giving a ton of capture weight. So the, uh, the value trading is also appears to be favoring the forces of Chaos Undivided. We do see the Warriors of Chaos army sitting at 4,800. The Skaven army sitting at 32. Massively outvaluing the forces of Marked Chaos. Gordon, thank you. A shirtless cam. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Maybe a, se maybe a separate stream someday. Yes. I'll just wear a Carl Franz helmet and eat hot dogs, and you guys can watch that. Be great. It's a matter of time. Sounds like something that belongs on Twitch. Poison Wind Globadiers over here, nuking into these forces. And, uh, you know, Chaos Undivided doing good on value, but being pushed back a little bit in terms of objectives. We do see this back objective has been taken by the forces of Zinch. So Zinch was able to get the Severed Claw and several units of Blue Horrors here. And the fact that they have the Severed Claw kind of saturated in is really going to be helping them fight off these other heretics. And the Swords of Chaos looked like they wanted to come in there and help. So Swords of Chaos, oh, the Apocalyptic Charge. What a badass name. But the Swords of Chaos uh, bouncing out to take down some Chaos Warriors. But having the Severed Claw here really gives a solid buffering and really good durability as we see more Devoted Brawners coming in. So yeah, the two armies um, of Chaos, uh, the God Chaos, they moved up and were able to take the back objective. Sigvald moving up and uh, yeah, looking like like the value says that the Skaven and Warriors of Chaos are like really ahead. But it just feels like they're being pushed back on every single front. Yeah, only Franz. We'll make an only Franz account, yes. Hey, Sieg, thank you so much. And uh, Gordon, I appreciate you becoming a member, man. Means a lot, my friend. On the other side, Pink Horrors cruising up. Sigvald is here as well. Back objective being pressed very, very heavily. The combined damage value of these armies is about 8.5 to uh, a little bit over 10, almost close to 11 here for the forces of Chaos Undivided. But the Skaven seem to be getting pushed back on many fronts. Here we do see more Hellstriders penetrating into the backfield. I'm like looking for Skaven units 
And I really don't see a lot of them, although we do see Rad Ogres coming in in tandem with some Gutter Runners. And it looks like the real bastion of strength here for Chaos Undivided is the Double Chieftain Warlock Engineer sitting on this objective here. They definitely need to get active. We have a couple of heroic characters for Chaos Undivided that aren't quite getting the job done here. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're holding on to the point, but yeah, you need to be contesting your home point because these points will creep up on you very, very quickly in a uh, 2v2. So. so did we skip the February member goal? Uh, to be honest, I just forgot what month it was when I made that. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. That is the February goal. Yeah, that is the February goal. <laughs> Groovy. Yeah, no. Ash vs. Evil Dead and all that. It was great. Army of Darkness. Good references as always. Hellstrider's getting nuked, man. The pink horrors and the popcorn bandits getting some really, really good uh, DACA into those Hellstriders and the back objective being firmly held. Sigvald's really, really tough to get off points and that could be an issue for the Skaven. The Even if they're up in value, they might not be able to remove characters like Sigvald and you have to remember all the Zinchin units are getting their uh, shields regenerating and different things like that. So... Back here, Chaos Undivided holding on to this point, but they need to make a really consolidated effort to get this point back. We do see a couple Globe Deers creeping up. Globe Deers are definitely a step in the right direction. I don't know why I don't have the drawing tools when I'm looking at replays. It's very, very strange, but nonetheless, we do need Poison Wing Globe Deers to kind of creep up there and uh, wear down these units. We see Valkyrie the Bloody for Chaos Undivided chasing down the Exalted Chicken of Change up in the sky. And that could be a variable as well. Like a lot of the value for Chaos Undivided could be coming from, you know, getting a lot of damage on this chicken, which they haven't finished off yet. So it's still pretty combat functional with its magic magic and whatnot. But more Globadiers trying to creep up. I definitely think some mortar teams would be pretty strong right now. We do see the Avalanche Mortars. How much value have we seen from them so far? 1,200. So they've almost paid for themselves. Not quite. Double Globadiers moving up as well. And Chaos Undivided still really chilling super heavily on the side objective. They are leaving a lot of units here. I think they need to press or pull them back to this objective and just, you know, they can they can respond to this pretty quickly. But yeah, the opponents holding this point for this long has been pretty brutal. Skaven here getting some really, really good shots. We do see the Poison Wing Globadiers nuking into the Blue Horrors of Zinch and uh, melting those bad boys as more Globadier fire hammers into the pinks. I, I love the, po the Avalanche Mortars. It's so cool that like each faction gets to kind of utilize its strengths and uh, synergize with one another. I think, I think 2v2 domination, honestly, in many ways is better than the 1v1 dom. It's more engaging. There's a lot going on. Big Mortar Fire. It looks like Chaos Undivided is getting some momentum to push back this point. We see the double Rad Ogres coming in for Chaos Undivided, uh, but they need a little bit of infantry support. Fighting unsupported against like Weird Spawn and Pink Horrors is going to be leading to their demise pretty quickly. Chaos Undivided does have a couple Marauders up in the point as well as a Chieftain. It's still owned by Zinch and Slanesh. The Severed Claw and uh, obviously Sigvald's basically like a permanent capture weight right there. So he's going to be able to kind of hold on to that one. In the backfield, we do see Valkyrie the Bloody. Valkyrie is still hunting down this Exalted Lord of Change, not quite able to find the prize. Those chickens are some of the hardest things to kill in the entire game. If you're trying to kill them in melee, good luck with that. It's not going to happen. But if you have range, you can sometimes kill them. But Dude, Avalanche Mortars raining some unholy fire down. But they're behind a tree line, which is unfortunate. Probably some of their shots are hitting into the trees. But even still, uh, very, very good stuff. And we do see more Hellstriders coming in for the actual Slanesh God Army flanking in. And the capture weight for Chaos... Uh, the God Chaos is, is looking very, very good here. You can see it almost had the double arrow for a second. Wolf Rats moving in to try and take this back point. Looking at the damage value so far, we see a combined damage value of 7.6 plus 6.7. So not bad, but you know, Warriors of Chaos doing pretty good here. So are Skaven. I still think there might be a slight value lead for the forces of Chaos Undivided, but they seem as if a lot of that value is tied up in the Exalted Lord of Change. like Because that's like basically 2,000 value of damage done on that chicken, whereas the damage hasn't been done to the army quite as much. I think that's really what we're seeing right here. So Globadiers still nuking in. Sigvald and company holding on to the point. It's getting real, real danger close. This objective being camped by Chaos Warriors and Chosen of Slanesh and more Marauders. You really need to be on top of unsummoning as well in this format, I noticed. When I was playing Empire earlier, I found that I would have a ton of resources to spend and I just simply didn't have anything to spend it on because I wasn't unsummoning super efficiently. It seems to be more pertinent in this format because each player has smaller armies and you have the same amount of resources to spend. So you have to like really, really be cycling or, or have something that's really like expensive that you can perpetually be resummoning as it gets karate chopped and whatnot. So. So Chaos Warriors and Chaos Warrior Halberd is going to be hustling up to the point. And uh, they might be able to get it back, but it's closing in on 1,000 points here. Really, really good stuff from both teams. I love the synergy of the Skaven Weapon teams backed by the Chaos Infantry. And then, of course, seeing like Slanesh with the really good uh, durable infantry and the Zinchi and Magic and range support. It's really, really cool to see that. But yeah, this objective is going to be pretty firmly in the control of Chaos Undivided here. Looks like they're going to be able to hold on to that one for quite some time, but this objective has been an absolute menace to get back. But look at this. Chaos Undivided is going to wrestle this point. As of now, it looks like it was flipping. Okay. Severed Claw moved back on. We do get some Skaven Slaves and Hellstriders moving on, but the Hellstriders, of course, are from the God Armies, and uh, it kind of is a little bit tricky to tell with some of the banners, but hopefully we'll have less mirror matches once we get out of the earlier rounds. But uh, yeah, the objective flips back to the God Armies. Yeah, they're able to hold it. 
They have the Chaos Undivided has the two armies here, but they don't have the uh, fire team support that they really, really need. Let's look at this in the backfield. Oh my god, that is a lot of hounds. Jesus. There's like there's like three or four units of like hounds down here just chasing things down, trying to protect the Skaven weapon teams, which are just being harried and poked. Now the Skaven player, uh, VA, is going to be summoning out the Poison Wind Globadiers. A very, very good choice. Globadiers definitely will be quite useful for clearing off the point, but Sigvald is just such a... he's <laughs> Sigvald, he's so hot right now. He's holding on to that point, man, and not letting anybody get it. He's like a dog with a bone there. Now, is there going to be any sort of a threat on the side objective? We do see some Rotter Horsemen moving up. Also, some uh, Blues going to be getting a little bit of Daka. They could definitely turn and start pressuring this point, um, but there still is a fair amount of Chaos Undivided units on this point here, but... Overall, it looks like the Marked Gods might be able to move that up. Looking at the points, it's 11.43. It's very much getting to a time soon where it's going to be a triple cap situation. So, Skaven shooting with the Natty Bubo Sharpshooters. It looks like the Skaven player might get the little rat cackle here. So he is able to blast that Exalted Lord of Change hitting at 1600 HP. We see the, uh, the Natty Bubo Sharpshooters trying to bring that thing down. Oh man, killing the giant chicken would certainly be quite nice. And Zinch characters, Zinch birds are really strong because they're big terror causing monsters that basically have infinite healing and uh, really, really good magic utility and all that sort of good stuff. So yeah, it's very, very nice for sure. So Prince Sigvald the Magnificent still grinding up on the point. This objective being held onto by the gods. We do see the Swords of Chaos moving back in, trying desperately to clear off the infantry. The Apocalyptic Charge active as well. And we do see a Fajasa and Ghoul Baby here doing a good job, but just holding on. Devoted Marauders, Chaos Warriors, Sigvald just being a Chad. But there's a lot going on in the backfield that we aren't really perceiving as much. Um, every time the Skaven are bringing in weapons teams, you can see the Furies and or other backfield pressure assets that Chaos does have, like Valkia and the Exalted Lord of Change are just doing a masterful job of shutting down um, the Skaven weapons teams back here. We see they're all very beat up and they're really needed to get the point because currently the Warriors of Chaos can't really get this point on their own. I'm surprised we didn't see more Archeon. I feel like Archeon is really, really good in team games. You could go Archeon with... Um, Archeon with, yeah, there's no access to healing for Archeon as of now. Zinch army ability going down. Brutal. Oh my god, it nukes them into the Shadow Realm. And the objective started to actually flip back, but that Zinch army ability might have actually ruined the chances of Chaos Undivided getting these points back. On the other side, we do see objective uh, two being firmly held onto by Chaos Undivided. A couple nice Warhounds here from VA are able to swarm in and chase down those horsemen and uh, kind of fend those guys back. But really, the tail of the tape has been Sigvald. Just being so hot right now, holding on to the back point and, uh, you know, not letting it go. We see the objective here being held by uh, Marked Chaos as they're not letting Chaos Undivided get that point back. Really, really good positioning here from the Globes. Just kind of sitting and cackling and nuking into the point. And eventually, these Globadiers probably will clear the enemies off. However, they do do friendly fire. And friendly firing into Chaos Warriors is a little bit painful for sure. Because you're doing, you know, a bit of damage to, you know, some good quality units of your allies. But it's better than nothing. You definitely need to. Swords of Chaos lurking about. We do see the chicken moving in. Spirit Leech going down. He's very, very low. That Spirit Leech might get him. And the chicken's going in for one last hoorah as he does land right here. But honestly, this game's pretty much over. Even if they get this point back, Chaos Undivided is not going to have enough time to capture this back point. We do see uh, infantry being spammed out, just uh, Chaos Warriors. And uh, they're hunkering down on this back point here, knowing that they have held those points long enough. And the value trading is actually pretty even. It is, if not a, a slight advantage for Chaos Undivided, but they just were not able to get Sigvald off that point. And uh, they paid the iron price. GG, well played, man. Great game. It's really fun. Took place on that back point mostly, but uh, that was a, that was a, that was a fun time. Mortal Nurgle Sorcerer Lord. Oh, uh, okay. So you you can you do that? You could bring a you could do double warriors of chaos, and one of you could bring a Nurgle Sorcerer Lord. Can you actually do that? Or oh, actually you could. You could go do double warriors of chaos. One of you brings Festus, and the other one brings Archeon. Oh man. That seems like a nasty combo. Anyways, what did really well? Well played to those mighty champions. And again, Sieg and uh, Gordon and all of you guys for your donations. Thank you so much, man. All right. So, taking a look here. We do see uh, we do see the Slaneshi forces basically just held, man. They just, they just got up there and they held. We saw Ghoul Baby flying around with the big chicken. I love the severed claw. They're literally full health and they fought the entire game. Crazy stuff. Really, really good Fury play, too. The Furies, 1,200, 1,000, 1,300. Like, the Furies were, I think, the MVPs that game. And Sigvald. The Furies and Sigvald would be my MVPs. And for the Warriors of Chaos team, let's see how the Swords of Chaos did. Yeah, not as hot as you would like. The Chad Chosen of Slanesh, 1,200 on them. They actually uh, held that side point very well. Skaven weapon teams were good, but they did get shut down. But he did a good job of using them as well. It was a very, very solid game. Severed Claw only got like 900 value, but overall they did pretty good for themselves. So let's go to the brackets, and that is going to be uh, Marked Chaos advancing. So Marked Chaos will for sure be fighting the undead. Hey, Linus, thanks for becoming a member. 
the green tide in our chat is growing. We gotta um sometime in the next few days or the next week, the wife and I are gonna make some new uh channel channel uh badges and everything. So we'll get you guys all spruced up there. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it, Linus. What do you have as your picture? Is that is that Littlefinger from Game of Thrones? I can't quite tell. All right, so now it is time for us to suffer. You guys ready to suffer? Time for the undead mirror match. I almost just want to skip it. <laughs> do we do we just skip the undead mirror match? Because we know an undead's going to win, right? Do we? All right, let's put it to a poll. We have a lot of games to cast today, so I wouldn't mind skipping an undead mirror match. Whatever you guys vote. Okay, let's do this. All right. Do we do we do it? Hey Cass, thanks for becoming a member as well. Thank you. You guys know, don't make me cast it. What are you doing? Really? You want to suffer? Oh, you guys are just cruel. 70% voting no. Oh my god. We want Why do you guys want this? Why do you want it? <laughs> Executive decision, skip it. I, what am I gonna veto the, the the Senate here? All right, guys, you guys you guys chose suffering, so the suffering will begin. So let me just go ahead and switch this over here. And uh, hey, Bob, cast the game at four times speed. All right, so where is this one? All right, so this is a, this is a fun one. We got some very strong players in this game, though. So let me go ahead and get the. Uh, so they are the glue versus. Uh, all right. So looking to be set. We're going to be doing the undead match next. I know you guys really just like to suffer. I don't know what it is, man. Sure, <laughs> it is the Senate. Yes, of course. So let's load in. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I'm making sure I don't accidentally cast uh, any of those games again. Because that's something I would do. Just join it, jump into the exact same replay and just cast it and just be like, oh, this seems kind of familiar. It's a blessed number, though. 69%. It must be obeyed. I know. All right, guys. So here we go. Uh, let me adjust the nameplates. You, you guys got to love the aesthetics. Uh, uh, there we go. So we have two undead teams. One of them is championed by um, several RTK players that you may know, Houseplant, as well as Subutai. So it's going to be the Glue Eaters, who are Vampire Counts and Tomb Kings, facing off against Vampire Coast and Tomb Kings. And the other team is going to be known as the Dreaded Krell, which is quite a bit of fun for sure. All right, looks good. Everything's loading in. We are on the Celestial Lake in the first round. Do it. Can you explain explain what Bronzodia is? Yeah, so it's just a term I, I use to refer to like, you know, you have like Bronze bronze League and other like video games. It's basically like when like a, a haggard play is made, you know, we'll say it's Bronzodia. Yeah. <laughs> Give us the replay, Ron Wriggling. Oh my God. All right, guys. Here we go. It's the undead. Yes. This is what you wanted. You brought this upon yourselves. What's my name? Thank you. Thank you so much for becoming a member. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have Subutai and Houseplant. Two top 16 leaderboard players playing on the Tomb Kings and Helmand Gors faction. Facing off against Moose Lord and Leech Lord. Uh-oh, we have the Lord team, guys. Are the Lords going to be upsetting the mighty RTK champions? I'm already a fan of them. The fact that they brought the Gallows Giant certainly scores some big points with me. But let's take a look at the armies here, guys. So for the Tomb Kings and uh, the Glue Eaters, yes. It is going to be a bunch of Nakar Warriors backed up by the Ushapti Grapos here. Is it, was it, is that their team name? Is it Eaters or, or do they sniff? Let me, let me, let me get the team name correct here as I look. Um, I know there was something pertaining to Glue. Let me move up. Yeah, no, they're the glue eaters. Okay, that's what it was. Hey, thanks for becoming a member, man. I really, really appreciate it. Welcome to the Dukes of Haggard. Chuck Norris's roundhouse kick blesses you. So Manfred von Karstein teamed up with Grand Herofant Kotzap. On the other side, the lords are going to be Solastra and Setra the Imperishable. I think this is a more probable alliance. Like, the Tomb Kings would definitely team up with the Vampire Coast before they would with the Vampire Counts. Unless we're talking about, like, Ark and the Black and things like that. So yes, catapults coming in. We do have Screaming Meme catapults, double Ushapti Grapo for both sides. So here we do see Houseplant does have the Chosen of the Gods as well as some Ushapti here. And man, he gets some big value early on. He immediately just absolutely wrecks these Death Guard here. So the Death Guard getting chased back, but the Ushapti don't want to be dueling other Ushapti. 
So they're going to be retreating back as the two forces just kind of shell one another. Now, for Subutai's army, Subutai's got double Necromancer. Both are going to be violently stroking their Forbidden Rods. We do have the Corpse Cart with the un Unholy Loadstone. Graveguard, Sarnsman, and good quality infantry. That's, that's the thing. Vampire Counts have some of the... Probably some of the best infantry in the entire game. I think, like, cost-effectively, and speaking in terms of cost-effectiveness, uh, Graveguard are, hands down, some of the best infantry in the entire game. Like, I'm trying to think, like, Graveguard, Marauder Champions, if we're talking, like, mid-tier infantry, I don't think anything really challenges them for that slot. So this objective is going to be going to the Vampire Counts and the Tomb Kings. The other side, Coast, uh, what units do they have? We do see some carrying into the backfield. Manfred von Baldstein. Oh, he gets the bald skeleton summon. Look at that. On top of the Screaming Skull Catapult. Really, really sneaky play there from Subutai as he creeps around the side. But the Gallows Giant is here. Oh, yes, dude. The Gallows Giant. I love it. This is great. Yeah, I love all the Lord of the Rings references in chat as well. Uh, so I'm going to be starting a, uh, a tabletop army for Lord of the Rings uh, strategy battle game. Really excited for that. I decided on playing Minas Tirith. So I'm going to be doing like a ranger-focused Minas Tirith, like the Osgiliath Defense Force. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. So it's going to have like Faramir, and I'll probably get Boromir in there eventually as well, but very excited. Anyways, back to the action. We do see a lot of undead moving up on the point. Oh, big winds of death! Big winds of death coming in from Moose Lord! Now, it's only zombies, so it's not that much value, but it also did hit some Grave Guard as well and brought them down to almost half health. So that was actually a good winds of death. Yeah, melting through the chaff? I mean, certainly not bad. How are these guys not... How are they not crumbling? They're at like 2%. So now the two undead legions going to be clashing in the objective, but Vampire Counts are certainly the kings of the grind. We do see the Death Guard coming up to clear some zombies, teamed up with Setri the Imperishable, and an Ushapti Great Bow duel. So we do have the Ushapti Great Bow of uh, the Glue Eaters battling against uh, these Ushapti over here on the far side of Team Krell. Which is weird because there's no, like, Heinrich in the team, but, you know, they try their best. So Solastra are going to be doing the Knight's Errant Summon. We do see the damn Knight's Errant coming out into the point. Very good against Graveguard because they have 100% armor piercing. So you can ride them into Graveguard and cycle charge them. And then Solastra is immediately on summon, so they just brought her for that as well. So not bad. But yeah, vampires have a, a rock, just a rock hard control of this objective. Graveguard with corpse carts, backed up by Eyes of the Desert shooting here. The Gallows Giant is just using its flamethrower right now and, and kind of melting down some of the Nahakar warriors. But as far as value goes, it does have 56 kills. It's at about 600 value, which actually isn't bad at all. So here comes another flamethrower shot. They have re really, really weird animations the way that they do shoot. But this objective is also going to be getting pressed. So here you can see the forces of Houseplant are going to be pushing up just math. They have a lot more infantry, it would seem. So we do see the Kepra Guard and Nekar Warriors coming up. The Ushapti Great Bow Duel appears to be slightly favored for the forces of Houseplant as well, as these Great Bows are a little bit lower health than these Great Bows. And oh, it's because Invocation! Did I see an Invocation? I did. Wow, so look at that. So Subutai was using Invocation of Nehek to resurrect and heal Ushapti Great Bows to help him win that duel right there. Oh, man. That's 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 some MLG plays for sure. That's some MLG plays. And yeah, Vampire Counts can cast Invocation on most Tomb King's units. It's very, very scary. More Dissension being brought in from Subutai, which is a good call because they're starting to lose the infantry fight a little bit here. You can see some Death Guard moving up and actually grinding through these Cryptors and doing some good work. Uh, but the More Dissension is going to solve that problem. The More Dissension will be able to drain these units down and also heal up your other pieces, and it's certainly quite good. Manfred running in the sky, being chased by some Carrion. Here we do have the forces of, uh, this is Houseplants Kothep, and this is the other Tomb King's Lord of Leech Lord. So Leech Lord is here with Cetra. Cetra could definitely cause some problems and honestly maybe even come over here and kill Kothep. Although Kothep is supported by the Eyes of the Desert, so I suppose that would not be an easy pick. But Subutai's Unholy Blob here is just keeping the forces of Vampire Coast off. We see more Depth Guard coming out. We do also see the Gallows Giant. Looking at value trading right now, 3.8 to 3.3. Both sides do have access to Invocation and Healing. But the value trading is actually very, very even between these uh, these two sides for sure. Yeah, yeah, Legamus 100%. I'm going to be making an Athelion themed army. Yeah, like the Rangers of Athelion. So Faramir and uh, the Rangers. And I'll have Frodo, Sam, and uh, Gollum in the army as well. That'd be really fun. More Dissension, drain and drain and drain in. And that's going to be giving him a big advantage because this More Dissension can then move up to the high ground, fight in the forest. Although, ooh, nice shot right there. We do see these sneaky snakes, the Sepulchral Stalkers there, getting some good DAC into the Mortis Dissension. Cetra also moving over. Now, what needs to happen right now is we need to see Moose Lord grab the Gallows Giant and go use its uh, fire attack melee attacks against the Mortis Engine. Although Subutai is very used to this, and he pulls a bunch of Crypt Horrors in, and it's going to be using the Crypt Horrors to block up Cetra the Imperishable. So, going to be able to kind of hold that down there. Now, on the other side of the battlefield, it looks like Houseplant moving up with a ton of Nehekara Warriors, and there is a response coming in from the forces of Moose Lord and Leech Lord, aka Team Krell. 
and we do see the um, we do see some sirens coming out with pretty good speed, but they're going to get melted. Honestly, sirens are like glass cannons now. After the the patch that changed their physical resist, even though they got bonus HP, without their physical resist being like eighty or ninety, like it was, they just die so quickly. They're a little bit less obnoxious though, for sure. So now Car Warriors up on the point. Is it going to flip? The fact that like it's being threatened though, even if they don't get it, and they have Banford who can get over here and stick and move a little bit. Um, means that there's going to be less like support coming for the forces of Team Krell over here on this side. We do have the Sepulchral Stalkers here, uh, so I'm giving a little bit of fire support. Mortis Engine just cackling in melee, and uh, this is really going to be securing Subutai and Houseplant a big victory. Subutai with really beautiful Mortis Engine positioning. Gallus Giant is trying its best, but the Gallus Giant is always a bit of a weird unit in my experience. I mean, yeah, we'll see if it can pay for itself. It is up to 1300 value, which is not bad at all. But right now, it looks like it's being blasted by the Sepulchral Stalkers here. Oh no, those are the allied ones, but yeah, the ones on the other side are getting some shots. I didn't see their icons, I just saw their little laser beams. Grand Hierophant Kotzeb just sitting here, the, the DJ, and you know, he's just spamming spells. He's just spamming cheap spells, because that does give you the Restless Dead. Affects all... Now, I wonder... Oh my god, if that's a thing... So I'm going to keep a, an eye on some undead units for a while and wait and see when, when he casts another spell. If the Restless Dead affects your allies' army, that is going to be some seriously broken stuff. Some seriously broken stuff for sure. The backside objective taken by RTK. Manfred von Karstein able to come over here and he obviously unleashed all of his Bald Fury and was able to uh, help with some Winds of Death, which I believe just went down on this side. And that's going to be allowing uh, Houseplant's infantry to take that objective. So really, really good teamwork and synergy between those players there. I, I like that uh, Manfred kind of flying over there and helping quite a bit. So taking a look here, and does it affect the Vampire Count units? I'm looking to see the buff. He hasn't cast this spell in a while. I really want to see some people in chat saying that it does, but yeah, that, that would make this like Tomb Kings plus any other undead, like just an unholy combo. The amount of healing they're going to be getting across the board. And we do see Houseplant and Tubatai pulling ahead in value as well. In tandem with the extra healing they have, it's uh, it's got to be very, very nasty. I'm not seeing the effects go down. That's the Vampire Count healing passive. Kotzeb hasn't cast anything in a long time. I wonder if uh, Houseplant is maybe out of, uh, out of, what's it called? Out of Wind's Magic. Could be, could be. Yeah, there's, oh, it is. It is, I think. Wait, was that the Restless Dead or was that the Vampire Counts one? I legit think it, I just saw it. I saw Bigfoot. It happens. Nurgle's passive hits his allies, I'm pretty sure. That's rad. That's cool. I'm glad there's some neat synergies like that. The undead deserve each other. You know, they deserve each other. So back here on this point, we see some Death Guard moving in. Death Guard are normally a very good answer against Tomb King's infantry, but, uh, you know, they're still going to be just swamped down to sheer numbers. And we do see some Black Knights with Lances coming in. Black Knights going to be trying to penetrate into the backfield, going after some Sirenes. And you guys ready to see something real, real brutal? Uh, Black Knights, they themselves do magic damage. For some reason, they just got magic damage in the third game. A lot of things uh, for the Vampire Counts did. And these Sirenes are going to get folded up like a piece of paper by these guys. So It did happen. That's right. I'm not crazy. But yeah, big damage going down here, guys. And this game's looking like it's going to be over. Um, I'll do a little bit of fast forwarding just to spare you guys the monotony of it. Because it's basically just like Vampire Counts and Tomb Kings have a Ward Ascension grind going down here. There's no way that Team Krell is going to be able to push this one back. And up here, it looks like this similar situation. We see the Black Knights purging the reinforcements, providing some heavy armor to the situation. And uh, now we get more Black Knights coming over. Manfred just doing some serious work. And uh, and yeah, that's going to be it. There's no way they can get the objectives back in time, ladies and gentlemen. We see Carrion flying across, shutting down the catapults in the backfield. Very, very, very risky to bring static artillery against double undead because of Felbats and Carrion Spam. It's pretty much impossible to keep them alive. So if you were playing like Order Tide against these guys, I probably wouldn't bring static artillery. Like archers and things like that is fine, but like artillery pieces that can be crumbled is going to be brutal. So that's GG well played. Very dominating victory, but a good match nonetheless. Well played to Team Krell. Team Krell did win their first round matchup as well. They had a very, very solid victory. So anyone you're seeing in today's tournament did win earlier on. So uh, GG well played. Good game. You can bring two factions with healing. Yeah, no, absolutely wicked. Can the Necrotect heal Terracotta Sentinel? Oh, that would be the best play of all time, although they can't team up, so they're on different alliances. But I might change the alliances based on feedback. So yeah, Kotep just with the fat heals and just a lot of infantry, but he did, yeah. So Tomb Kings basically just went straight infantry, Grapos, and, and Necar Horsemen. And Vampire Counts... They had a little bit more Cav and Monsters action, so they brought Cryptors. And again, you're really seeing players capitalizing on the strongest things in the roster. Ushapti, Grapos, Nakar, Warriors, and Tomb Guard, probably some of, probably the like top top three or four units on the roster, right? For Vampire Counts, what do we have? We have Manfred for the WAM. We have the Grave Guard, some of the best units. Um, we have really good Cryptor support. Mortis Engine, just in case there's an Infantry Blob, which is uh, very, very good. Yeah, it was a fun match. Hey, Gordon, thanks, man. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the match.
Now, this was a really Chad army, though. We had de mass depth guard with the gallows giant. What you would have needed probably is bomber mobs. You would have needed some bomber mobs. So uh, that would have been the play. Yeah, a little bit too narrow in the starting armies. Like, I think if they had started wider and then come out with, like, all those special pieces, it could have been a little bit fancier. But they kind of struggled to meet that that width in the beginning of the game there. So, all right, let's go to the bracket. And uh, I guess it doesn't matter which undead we advance because we know, we know it's an undead team. All right, so in the next round, we have uh, Undead versus Marked Chaos. And Order is going to be facing the winner of Chaos Undivided and Marked Chaos. We have another match of like what we kind of saw earlier. So we'll be jumping into that in just a second. So where are we? All right. Where is this one? And that appears to be the matchup. So let's go ahead and take this guy out. There we go. We casted that one. And yes, perfect. So what are the team names here? Let me make sure I get these correct. Got to make sure to give the people the credit they deserve here. All right, cool. So almost got it. Just about to be updated. Blighted and bloody. So we have Team Blighted and Bloody facing off against the Dirty Warpstone Cheese. <laughs> pretty good team names today, honestly. They've been pretty good. Yeah, I've been digging it. All right, so let's load into this match. And all of the initial round games are in Celestial Lake. Next time I'll give different maps. But, uh, you know, some of the domination maps are really good for 2v2. Some are more designed for 1v1. But uh, we basically just have the bigger maps today. So, all right. So I need to fix that. So the Dirty Warpstone Cheese is a very long name. So it's going to have to be like a name for ants here. All right. The Dirty Warpstone Cheese versus the Blighted and the Bloody. Yes. So this is another uh, similar matchup to what we saw earlier. Oh, my God. Look at the Festus. <laughs> Look at the Festus. Dark Elves can team up uh, with two alliances. Dark Elves can team up with Destruction, so they can ally with Greenskins or Ogre Kingdoms. Uh, or Dark Elves can ally with um, the Elves, any of the Elves. So you could do like Elves Undivided, which is uh, High Elves, Wood Elves, and Dark Elves. So you could do like Dark Elves. Dark Elves and Wood Elves could be an interesting comp. Dark Elves have really good infantry quality, like really good. Corsairs, Bleak Swords are really strong. And then you could um, you could like have you know some some Wood Elf Archers and things like that. So no, it's only once Gaven actually. So, ladies and gentlemen, taking a look here, we have our God-specific uh, faction. And this is a combo I thought would be really, really strong. So, this on this side, it's going to be Valky, the Bloody, and Festus. This is our uh, God Chaos here. So, this team is going to be... Let's go ahead and get this. Yeah, so this is going to be Menacing, Platypus, and Sandwich. And on the other side, we have Drakens and House Cat of War. This is going to be a Skaven and Warriors of Chaos army. We do have the Chieftain. Oh, my God, they brought Gorich. They brought Gorich, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my god, I can't believe we're seeing Gorich in the battlefield. We do have the Summoners of Rage as well. Festus is going to be able to heal Gorich up. So the ultimate combo. Skaven in the backfield, going to be summoning in Avalanche Mortars. Avalanche Mortars seem to really be super meta in 2v2. Like, you don't see them as much in 1v1 because they're probably hard to protect. But when you have a Warriors of Chaos front line, it definitely can get the job done. But Chaos Undivided on this side and Marked Chaos on the other side. And uh, it is going to be your boy Festus coming into party, man. Which triple chin will triumph? Well, it's basically just one giant chin. It's not technically like a triple chin. You guys get the picture, but... Hmm. It should be good. Yeah, Valkyrie gets some healing. I mean, she's not like a someone who really, really needs healing super hard. She's pretty elusive and hard to damage anyways. Like, I, I really wanted to see like a Scarbrand. Like, imagine Scarbrand just going ape in this army. Getting like fleshy abundances and just like tearing shit apart. That's kind of what I was looking for. But yeah, quite excited to see the Summoners of Rage. We do see Aspiring Champions coming in for Chaos Undivided. And uh, the Skaven Weapon team is going to be moving up. And obviously starting to drop some uh, pretty fat nukes for sure. I don't really know if Gorich has any issues with his animations. But it's uh, it's very, very fun to see it nonetheless. So the winner of this match will be going on to face the Order Tide. The Bretonian Wood Elf Alliance who is waiting on the top side of things. On the bottom here, a lot of Plague Bears coming out. And uh, Nurgle, I honestly think, guys, I think Nurgle is one of the strongest 2v2 factions. Because they do infantry almost better than anyone, and their healing is insane. What they don't do well is mobility and anti-large, but if you have a faction that can handle those other aspects, then Nurgle becomes like an invaluable ally. Like, just the healing, the mortis engine effects, the good quality infantry on objectives. It seems like it's very, very nice. Yeah, the Fe if Festus, they should just both send their Festus out right now, just just like Boagrius and Achilles and, and uh, Troy, and just have them fight and see whose army wins. 
That would be pretty funny. But um, yeah, Festus, not the best duelist, but he can definitely go fisticuffs with like casters and things like that. He only has 380 weapon strength, so he's he's more of a good doctor. The Minotaurs are going to be a bit of a problem as well. These Minotaurs are quite nasty. We do have Minotaurs with great weapons, uh, three of them in total. Not a ton of targets, but they'll still be good against Hellstriders and, you know, against these Chieftains and any sort of characters that are, you know, and, and Summoners of Rage here. So they, they do have targets. Now, what I saw that was really powerful when we were doing a little bit of playtesting this week was people using, um, we played against Skaven and uh, Warriors of Chaos, and Festus uh, healing like a Skaven character blob of like Chieftains was actually quite strong for sure. So here we do have Minotaurs of Corn with great weapons, and yeah, they'll, they'll pound whatever they really want to get on. So we do see some aspiring champions move on. But Corn Tours are really, really good. And these are going to be the Corn Tours of, I believe, Sandwich. Yeah, there's, it's a little bit confusing. The banners are kind of similar here, guys. And it hopefully we'll get a little bit better as we advance on and have less like Chaos versus Chaos Mirror matches. But Chaos just won so many damn first round matches, it just kind of became the way of things. Avalanche Warder is doing some brutal stuff. I mean, I think they're so good here. It's bringing down a Plague Bear unit to half health instantly. We do see a Cultist of Nurgle. Cultist really good. Uh, having the AoE debuffs from the Icon of Eternal Virulence, as well as the Warrior's Bane. Really, really lowering the stats. Look at the stats on these Dragon Ogres. 80 weapon strength. That is a big, big debuff. And now we get the Baron to the Bog. So I love this for Menacing Platypus. Platypus is bringing all the debuffs. He's got the Cultist. He's got the Baron to the Bog. So the stat line of these nearby units is going to be trash. As long as he can just keep them alive with Festus and not get nuked into the Shadow Realm by these big Avalanche Mortars. I don't see any way Nurgle and, uh, and their corn allies are going to lose this point. Although a huge, huge AoE blob punishment spell. Really good flensing rune from Ikit Claw. Talk about beautiful targeting. And that's how you beat such blobs. You rain unholy mortar fire on them and you cast flensing rune. So flensing rune doing some big damage. Barons of the Bog getting beat up. I would wager an overcasted fleshy abundance is going to be coming in soon. We do see Gorge fighting over here. Oh, hell yeah. Let's watch Gorge for a second. Screw the rest of the battle, man. So Gorge going to be pounding some of these plague bears here, and in theory, I mean, he should be good against them. He's a big anti-infantry, you know, monster, and uh, he should have some good splash attacks. I don't really know. I haven't seen him in action too much, but uh oh, the Festus uh, chin battle is upon us. They're going for it. Look, it's it's the Festus is battling the Toads, guys. The duel of fates. Oh my God, it's actually happening. Look at them. They're rubbing their chins together. Dude, I did not expect an actual Festus duel to happen. I thought that was just going to be a joke, but. Legit, there is a Festus duel here. Ice Pilgrim for Sigmar Press Like. Thank you, man. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the battle rages on as the two Festuses rub their chins together, taking a look at the other side of the battlefield. It looks like Chaos Undivided using their Globed Ears and Warriors of Chaos front line to fight off the Plague Bearer push. We do see some Flesh Hounds of Corn coming in to try and break through. But overall, it seems like the uh, Skaven and the uh, Chaos Undivided have been able to kind of hold back the push, but there are some Minotaurs penetrating into the backfield, but very good response here from House God of War. House God of War are going to be getting those Hellstriders out, and those Hellstriders are going to be giving the dirty to these Minotaurs. So the Minotaurs uh, definitely going to take a bit of damage. However, they are Corn Tours, so they do have 70 armor, but they're fully surrounded now. Rat, rat Ogres and Hellstriders on top of them, that's going to be game blasted for those guys. But really, uh, the big part of this is going to be coming down to the side objective here. And we do see the uh, battles very back and forth. The objective's just flipping. We see Exalted Plague Bears coming in from Platypus. And the Skaven player on the other side just sending in a horde of chaff. We got Gorich. We got Ikit Claw with the big fat flensing runes. You ready to see Ikit Claw's value? I wager it's already over 2,000. Let's see. Yeah, very close. 1,800. Yeah, so he's going to be closing in on that 2,000 value mark. And we do see the, uh, man, this objective just going back and forth and back and forth. Valkia coming in to support Festus. And the Cultist, I think the Cultist really really is going to be a big difference maker as long as he stays like close to the main line fighting that objective for sure could flip nice uh stream of corruption going down there does plow through some of the clan rats here festus just sitting with his healing elixirs and he is so good in team games so festus is basically sitting here guys and he is just dropping fat heals on his entire team so all these all these marauders and trolls and and skaven just fighting up in the front are getting healed by festus which is just makes him such a good support piece such a good support piece for sure now, the objective appears to be flipping. Looks like the forces of, uh, of the gods, the Marked Chaos gods, or the Marked Chaos factions. They have the Exalted Plague Bears. They have two Plague Bear units. They also have these Chaos Warriors uh, up on the point. And the Skaven are starting to falter a little bit. Gorich trying to do some anime spinning here and uh, try and take down your boy Festus. And he's actually getting some really good damage. But if you look at his stats, 872. Oh, he's got the Warp Frenzy active. Holy shit. Gorch has given the dirty to Festus, guys. Wow. You know, if Festus were to die, that would be massive. That would be a massive win. And Gorch is definitely capable of killing Festus. I mean, he's a way stronger fighter. But he seems to be, like, missing some of his attacks. Okay, he hit him right there. Festus is in real, real danger as Gorch just has a full heart on to try and take him out. Looks like he's sitting at 2,000 HP. Gorch very healthy at about 7. And Gorch has a big HP pool himself. And look at that. 
Just getting absolutely slayed by Gorge. Does he have any reinforcements coming in? It looks like he does. There are going to be some Minotaurs coming over the hill to rescue him. Because without these Minotaurs right here, Gorge would just annihilate Festus. His triple chin would wiggle no longer. So Healing Elixir is active. Minotaur is going to be trying to salvage the situation. Ten leadership right now. Got to be careful not to break too much. He could start to, uh, he could start to uh, shatter if he breaks too many times. We'll have to see. But Gorge does get blocked up. And it looks like there is going to be some magic going down. As we do see the Miasma of Pestilence. Which is also a tabletop spell in Warhammer 40k. Cast on top of Gorge here. So that's going to be debuffing his stats. And the Minotaurs have him surrounded. Really, really good support there from Sandwich. Sandwich coming in to help the homie out. Now on the other side, it seemed like Chaos Undivided actually getting some momentum here. We do see the Marauders as well as some uh, Chaos Warriors with Halberds moving up. Skaven Globadier is getting nice concave. So uh, yeah, that's some nice stuff. Look at that. Poison Wind Globes all day coming in from Drakens. Drakens, the Lord of the Skaven, Lord of Gorich. Council Guard also fighting in the front line. And uh, they better get an objective quick, though. I'm telling you, I don't know what it is about 2v2 domination, but it sneaks up on you quicker than 1v1. Like, because people can pour more things into objectives. So I, I, my anecdotal experience of playing some 2v2s for the past couple days has been that it's, um, it's a little bit harder to get the objectives, uh, to get them, like, to get an objective. Like, it just takes a little bit longer, for sure. So Globadiers just pounding any advancing infantry. That's got to feel pretty good. Now back here, how's our boy Gorge doing? Did he live? In the backfield, Valkyrie the Bloody going for a bit of a gooning, trying to take down Ikit Claw. And Valkyrie can absolutely massacre Ikit in a straight fight. So Ikit's going to want to roll and roll and roll and Fred Durst out of there for sure. Festus, the Leech Lord of the Warriors of Chaos, being attacked by the Cultist. Cultist uh, versus Festus? Looks like, yeah, the Cultist might actually have the advantage there. Considering he's got healing and he lowers Festus's weapon strength down to 169, that's what she said. That's not bad at all. Man, those okay, Nurgle cultists are so good. Pone and I were talking about it after our game this morning. We're like, all right, next time we're just going to go Nurgle and Corn and just mass SEs and just like have Festus heal them. That's that's just the way, right? It's very, very strong. But yeah, this Festus in danger. Valky the Bloody swooping in. Valky, of course, belongs to the other team and uh, is a far superior duelist to Festus. So Festus here going to be getting karate chopped by Valky. A little bit of Warriors of Chaos action. He drops a little bit of a gift on her there, but negative seven. And I would wager that we are going to be seeing Sandwich getting in there and uh, taking out the Festus of House God of War. Looking across the battlefield, though, Skaven, a little bit resurgent. We do see some momentum. You can see, like, a big battle line of, of Skaven and uh, Chaos Undivided. Granted, the back objective is being threatened a little bit. There's some, like, random-ass Minotaurs back here just fighting Chaos Armor Trolls. We do have great weapons, so they probably would win that as well. Clan Rat's going to be sending in there. And I think Gorich may have died, sadly. I think he might have died. Oh, no, he did it! Gorich lives! He almost died in the backfield. 666 HP, the sign of the beast. He's on his way back in. But this objective is held by the gods of chaos. So the uh, the, the marked chaos are holding this objective. Doesn't really look like there's much hope of uh, Chaos Undivided getting this one back. We do see Valky the Bloody is going to be hunting down Festus the Leech Lord, or at least should be hunting down Festus the Leech Lord right there. And this objective is for sure going to be held on to by the Marked God. So now they just need to kind of hold this counter push. We talked about how Chaos and Skaven were kind of winning in the center over here and finally started to get some momentum. But now they're in enemy territory. And you have to remember that Sandwich can summon out uh, Flesh Hounds all day, right? So Flesh Hounds, good quality, good fighty units. Minotaurs can also get there quite quickly. And uh, there are some Plague Bears up in the point. So the objective does flip for Chaos Undivided, guys. And now Chaos Undivided, the Skaven, and Warriors of Chaos really need to hold on to this objective for as long as possible. They just need to they just need to hold until they can one on one and then fall back. Because it's it's obvious that the marked chaos, Platypus and Sandwich, they have Festus. They have a Mortis Engine, they have AoE heals, they're gonna win a prolonged fight. The other Festus is being, being hunted to the edge of the earth. So Valky the Bloody doing a very good job hunting down her uh, Nurgle counterpart over here, and uh, Festus gonna get chased off the battlefield. Hellstriders coming out. This objective gonna be tough to get as well. Exalted Plague Bearers, basic Plague Bearers, some remnants of Exalted Plague Bearers. We have a Cultist here. So this is not going to be an easy one to wrestle, although very possible. I mean, if you bring some Globadiers and some weapons teams to chew through the Nurgle Infantry, you can definitely do it. And look at this. Nurgle is able to get some reinforcements in, and it looks like this objective is going to be going back to the forces of Marked Chaos. Currently, we have the Double Arrow, which means they're up by like probably like 15 capture weight on this, just exponentially more. Most of Chaos Undivided, their units here are just Route Ogres and a couple in like a beat up unit of Forsakens. Festus able to intercept in the middle. Chaos Warriors here are getting melted pretty hard. And on the other side, we do see a stream of corruption going down on these clan rats. Looking like it's probably going to be a W for uh, Platypus and Sandwich. I mean, it's crazy because looking at the value, yeah, 12 and 12, so about about 25,000. But here we do have 15,000 coming in from Corn. So this is how it should be. Corn should do way more damage than Nurgle, but Nurgle provides the healing, the sustainability, the blobs, um, all that sort of good stuff, right? So I really, really like the synergy of those units. 
Moving up here, we do get Festus Leaf Sword, more detentioning down those units, and now there's a little bit of a counter push going for the back objective. Is there going to be any way for House Cat of War and Drakens to kind of scrap back in this? There's just so many Plague Bearers, and the combined damage value here for these forces is about, about 24,000 to... Yeah, so the value is really close, actually. If you look at the value on both sides, it's very even, but I think the healing of Platypus has been much heavier than that of uh, the other team, so... The Nurgle healing has been insane. Like, there's so many healing capped units. Sword of Corn going down. Beautiful Sword of Corn from Sandwich there. And that's going to be a tap out. GG, well played. Hey, King of the Dead. If you use Bomber Mobs in the Undead vs. Undead match, would they not just uh, die because the anti-player really plays and you haven't made a <laughs> mod yet? Oh, you got me so good. Oh, King of the Dead got me. I actually thought you were asking a legit question. You son of a gun. All right, King. I think I think with that, you have earned it. Let's, let's get you here. All right, where are you? All right, King, you have earned it. You actually got me for once. That never happens, so we're going to give it to you right now. You you are officially a, a in-chat moderator here. <laughs> All right, great game. That was a fun one, actually. Even though the mirror matches are a little bit harder to follow, still really cool synergies, and we're learning a lot. I'm really excited to announce another one of these tournaments and see all of you folks who've watched who may join next time to see what you guys come up with. You know, that's, that's going to be fun. All right, guys. So... Let's get ready for the game, update the bracket. It is going to be uh, Marked Chaos advancing. So we have Marked Chaos versus the Order Tide and Undead versus Marked Chaos on the other side as well. All right. Professor Pone says these are truly dark days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so let's get this set up, man. Yeah, you, you're playing the bingo. You got the first one, Legal Chef 69. Yeah, first. It appears in every single stream. I don't know what it is. It just is always there. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure we got through all of the round of eight games. It looks like we did. All is good there. And yes. All right, so next up, we're going to go back to the Order Tide versus... Uh, who do they play next? Marked Chaos on the top side of the bracket. All right, so this is going to be the... Uh, what is their team name? It's like, it's like Dogecoin and uh, Master and Good Dogecoin. <laughs> it's just like... Okay, where do you where do you even come up with this name? And this is going to be versus the Blighted and the Bloody. So we're going to be seeing uh, Sandwich and Menacing Platypus once again recurring their roles as the mighty champions of chaos against the Order Tide. Who will, who will win this? And this is the West or the Western Order Tide because it has Wood Elves uh, in Bretonia in it. Yeah, the Wood Elves are part of the Western Order Tide. We have the Eastern Order Tide, which is like has Cathay and Empire in it. And then the East, the, the, the Western one has High Elves, Wood Elves. It has like a little bit of a different range. It's because you subconsciously seek out. Maybe so. I'm not really sure what the truth of it is. All right, so let's load in, guys. And this is going to be on... Okay. Looking good. And the map is all set. Dude, they are bringing the same stuff. Okay, it looks like that didn't update. Let's go ahead and update that. So Master and Good Dogecoin. And Blighted and the Bloody. Okay, there we go. I need to get like new nameplates that like you can actually read. They, I mean, they look, ugh, it's so haggard. Maybe the fonts just need to be better. I don't know, man, I'm hopeless. I'm hopeless. Oh, don't crash on me. Come on, don't crash. You can do it. So this is gonna be on the Graveyard of Altorf. It looks like the players opted to play a different map, which is fine, I don't care, it's casual. Um, but it is going to be Mel Gibson as well as Fae Enchantress once again. So this is going to be the dreaded uh, Order Tide, Wood Elves and Bretonian Alliance versus the Forces of Chaos. So it's going to be Corn and Nurgle once again. This is going to be really interesting. Nurgle definitely won't be as good on this map. I, I don't know why they, they played on this one. I don't think this was in my pool of maps. I am not sure, my friend. So it's basically the same. We see the Way Watchers. It's four Way Watchers coming in for the Order Tide. So we have the Fane Chantress, a Lifecaster, and Orion. But this time it's going to be Foot Squire based. Foot Squires are obviously good against Nur like basic Nurgle infantry and you know some of the Chaos Troopers, uh, especially the Fane Chantress support. We do have two Grail Knights in the back. Oh yeah, dude! Sign me up for the Grail Knights all day, every day. Grail Knights are so cool. So we've got two Grail Knights in the backfield. Definitely going to be good at wrecking large targets if they can get them. And the Wood Elves are the full Vanguard. So look at this. And Orion, the king of the, king of the woods, the hoof lord. Oh, look at him going, dude. What a Chad. 
You're just hustling out there. Going to be throwing some spears over at the Forces of Chaos. Now for the mighty RTK team. <laughs> There's like a ton of RTK teams today. But this is going to be Sandwich and Menacing Platypus. We got Festus. We got Valkia. Looks like they have a pretty similar composition to what we saw in previous games. So they're going to be able to just basically get a mass tide of infantry. They're obviously going to be playing Objective 1 and Objective 2. And that is going to be that. So we do see Valkia flying around in the sky. Better be careful, though. There's no Prey of Anothrama, though. Kark is not going to be wasting ammo on Valkia. He knows better. Valkia would be able to just juke those shots. Unless your opponent is just kind of sitting still. Dude, Orion's charge bonus is pretty pretty serious. When he pops the Horn of the Wild Hunt, it gets, uh, it gets pretty hard in the paint. I wonder if the Horn of the Wild Hunt affects allies in range. Oh, so the Horn of the Wild Hunt affects the Bretonian Cav. So 60% charge bonus on top of 95 is going to be putting him up to like 150 plus charge. Oh my god. I hope we see that combo this game because that seems super badass if that actually works. How neat is that? How neat is that? That's really, really cool. And you know, a lot of the maps that have been made for Total Tavern, um, for the tournament map pack, like they're actually really good for 2v2. Like there's some that are a little bit on the bigger end for 1v1 that are just like perfect for 2v2, like this one, for example, right? This is a great 2v2 map. So Valkia does get popped in the face, but Festus can obviously heal that. It does bait out the demon shield, which is good. I'm mean, Kark, I think when she's flying right over your head like that, it's worth taking the shot just to kind of like force it. Foot Squire is moving up as well, and in the backfield we got Spearman at Arms, so the Waywatchers is going to be sitting behind as Chaos is preparing to get a big charge. Is it 174 for the Grail Knights? Yeah, is that what it is? Oh my god, I love it. I hope we see that. Yeah, right, because it's going to be 50% on top of the bonus as well. Oh my god. That synergy is really, really neat. So we see Objective 2 being taken by the Order Tide. Um, nobody's on the outside objective yet. Looks like this is like a no man's land. This objective is pretty much free though. Looks like Bretonia is going to be sending some Men at Arms over there to capture that, so... Yeah, the Order Tide is going to be playing Objective 3 and Objective 2, and Chaos looks like they're going to be trying to take some initiative over here. But the mobility advantage does favor the forces of order. So the Dreadlords, uh, the True Bretonian and Kark, are going to be getting the Knights of the Realm out. Knights of the Realm will defeat Flesh Hounds in combat, and it looks like some Grail Knights are going to be coming over there as well to try and bait some of the Minotaurs. But yeah, very, very solid uh, positioning so far. Obviously, the objective in the middle is very, very important. It's kind of an anchor which allows you to bounce between the two side points here. And uh, here comes the Knights of the Realm. So will they get the charge on the Flesh Hounds? We'll find out here. Minotaurs of Corn with great weapons coming over to help. And we do see some Spearmen and Foot Squires on their way up. And in the backfield, the Grail Knights uh, getting ready to counter charge most likely the Minotaurs. I really just want to see the Horn of the Wild Hunt. I can just imagine them calling it out in Discord and just being like, Sound the Horn! And then the Knights just charge in there and hammer down. So this objective is being contested, but it looks like Bretonia should have the capture weight here, just barely. In the middle, Chaos has kind of sounded the horn of their own. So the Cultists of Nurgle on their way out. Waywatchers don't have a ton of great targets, honestly, but they're probably just going to be trying to snipe characters and Cultists and things like that. Looks like the Slopnir is going down. Really, really nice cast there. Didn't do as much damage as I would think against those Switzguards, but it was a good cast by, uh, by Sandwich. So the Hordes of Chaos are upon us. Side objective, I'm surprised they didn't try and contest this with something, but it looks like they're pretty hyper-focused on these two points here. We do see the Bretonian Cavalry sitting in the wings. The Lance Formation is ready, and are they going to get the charge? Is he going to get the charge, or is he not paying attention? Uh-oh. Bretonia gets the charge at the last second. So they do get the charge off. They get their charge bonus. And now we see the Minotaurs of Corn coming in to help out. Minotaurs of Corn will absolutely dominate Knights of the Realm in combat. And uh, another Lance Formation is out, and here they come. So I think the Grail Knights with Spear support with Eternal Guard probably win this. The Flesh Hounds of Corn are wavering a huge thunderous charge from those Grail Knights as they plow in. The Enchantress Board Ascension going down, and the Eternal Guard are shanking them. So overall, this is a winning fight for the Forces of Order. Now, how is the middle looking so far? Waywatchers, I guess they do have targets. They're shooting at Exalted Plague Bears, which are, you know, a pretty expensive unit and definitely good to focus. As soon as the Minotaurs come out of the trees as well, you see them get focused. So really, really good awareness by Kark, and obviously the Cavalry are protecting pretty well, but the Bretonian front line could start to fold. We do have Festus with his healing elixirs. Could switch that to a Mortis Engine. Minotaurs come out of the trees, and as soon as they come out of the trees, guys, they are just getting absolutely peppered. So Minotaurs here are discouraged, negative 16 leadership, and they are getting absolutely pounded by those archers. Foot Squires do out-trade Marauders as well, so uh, maybe they'll have a decent chance. And Orion is also bol bolstering the front line here. He's hanging out, he's getting some terror routes and going to help to break off some of those Chaos Warriors. We see Valkia moving, more Bretonian Cav coming in, and now back over to this side of things. We do see the Grail Knights and the Fane Chantress is really bullying this point. Uh, the Minotaurs of Corn with Great Weapons are actually on the run from the Grail Knights. Uh, the Spear Support really doing heavy work, but we do see a nice counterplay coming in from Menacing Platypus. Going to be trying to really uh, buffer the Forces of Chaos here on this side fight, using the Barons of the Bog to debuff. And look at this, we get some big Cornate Cav coming in. We have the Anti-Large Skull Crushers. 
So Skullcrusher is definitely can fight the Bretonian Heavy Cavalry. They will trade quite well in the Grail Knights because of their armor. Um, Grail Knights don't have the most armor piercing, so they can they can do very, very well for sure. But that Mortis Engine and the Bretonian Cab pulling back, perpetually winning these trades versus the Minotaurs here, quite nice. But the middle objective has been swarmed by the Hordes of Hell. So Chaos has taken the objective. We see Festus the Leech Lord, Cultists with their debuffing auras. The Foot Squire front line wasn't long for this Earth, and the Way Watchers in the backfield are still very much alive, being chased down by some Minotaurs. The true Bretonian definitely needs to salvage this, but really, really nice play by Chaos. Chaos able to just straight up overwhelm that middle. But the side objective was owned by Bretonia, but it looks like some sneaky doggies over here as well. So the sneaky dogs do take objective three, and uh, that could be a little bit of trouble for the Order Tide, as Chaos could get a double cap and start to get some momentum back here in this game. Looking at the value, though, it is certainly favoring the Order Tide. 5-5 five, five to 4. Uh, both sides do have access to healing, though. There's healing for the Wood Elves and Bretonia, and also for Nurgle. You know, they can heal themselves as well as their allies. But uh, the Bretonian Knights just bouncing around, just treating these guys like bowling pins and running over these units. But a lot of Minotaurs coming out here from Sandwich. Sandwich going to be able to swarm onto the back of those units. More Eternal, Eternal Guard coming in to try and help with the Minotaurs. And how is this fight looking here? Fan Enchantress Mortis. Grail Knights have done the job. So the Grail Knights of Bretonia able to clean down these Minotaurs. So the Minotaur is basically eviscerated. Really, really cool to see Grail Knights actually doing well. They're a unit that takes a ton of micro, but you know, obviously the top Bretonian player in the community is going to be able to do it, right? So he's able to make them shine. And uh, the Barons of the Bog are going to be dying. Fane Chantress will Mortis Engine everything down here. And really, just look at the absolute anarchy here in this fight. The Way Watchers are pulling back into the tree line. Minotaur is extending in, and they might be able to get in there. Oh, Skull Crushers as well. But the Grail Knights with the regrowth on them countercharge and blunt the momentum while the defenders of Flare to Lee pull back, sounding the retreat horn as Osgiliath has fallen and uh, time to return to Minas Tirith. But the Grail Knights really able to blunt that charge and keep those Way Watchers online. The Way Watchers are just methodically picking off so much, but. Order really needs to get the side objective back. That's pretty big. And we do see the Horn of the Wild Hunt, 64 charge bonus. And obviously the Britannian Cav, who are active on the battlefield right now, are going to get it. So 108 charge bonus on the Defenders of Flare de Lee is pretty badass. And how long does it last for? Uh, it lasts for another 9 seconds, but it looks like they're not really going to get a chance to use it, at least over here. But this objective most likely will flip back. And the Order Tide it really, really needs to reclaim the side. Chaos has really put their... Um, and they're marked down in the middle. You know, they basically sent a, 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 a assembled a huge Chaos Shrine here in the middle. That's going to be very tough to get back. And with Festus, Chaos Warriors, Exalted Plague Bearers all getting healed by Festus. Like, you don't want any of that shit. I think just playing the side points and using the mobility. And the Way Watchers bouncing, like, back and through the forest here to snipe the um, Chaos Warriors of Nurgle is pretty cool. So Glade Riders moving in, attacking these Chaos Warriors. Won't do super well against them. Knights of the Realm stuffing Nurgle. And, you know, this is the, there's like these weird choke points. But yeah, these Knights of the Realm are going to be able to hold back the, the Chaos Tide for a long time here. And Order does have a decent points lead already from the early game. We see these Chaos Warriors getting taken apart by the Way Watchers. A little bit of attempted pressure here, but great teamwork from both sides. As the Knights of the Realm intercept the Minotaurs, and then the Minotaurs get hit by the Hawkeyes of Drakira, which are the Arwar Way Watcher, which apply negative 16 leadership when they shoot something. So... Super cost-effective against the Minotaurs here, as it just makes them get run down by the Knights of the Realm even more efficiently. Way Watchers just sitting and taking pot shots into this big blob up here while the Knights of the Realm hold them at bay. Fan Chantress and company here. Looks like they're going to be rotating back to the middle, although you don't want to get too relaxed here. There's still two units of Chaos Warriors against your Eternal Guard. I mean, the Chaos Warriors could potentially win that fight if you're not careful, but it looks like the third Eternal Guard unit should be able to kind of seal the deal. So Fane Chantress moving back to the middle. Chaos still has a pretty good presence here. Exalted Plague Bearers, Chaos Warriors of Corn with Halberds, and uh, this middle point. This is really, really, really unfortunate for Chaos. They literally have like 3,000 gold worth of units, like Flesh Hounds, Festus, uh, you know, Marauders with dual weapons here, who are being blocked by these Chad Bretonian Knights. These guys are just like the, the characters in the movie who sacrifice themselves for the greater good of everybody else. That's basically these Knights of the Realm. They know they're going to die holding the Breach, but it's buying time for their brothers to win a fight elsewhere, so... Knights of the Realm, holding it down. We do see some uh, Demon Spew coming in. Valkia does pop the Demon Shield, making her pretty uh, pretty durable here, if not invulnerable, I should say. Demon Spew going to get focused, and they're getting popped by the Hawkeyes of Drakira. We see more Glade Riders coming back in. Eternal Guard going to be rallying. And what reinforcements do we see? It looks like there's going to be a resurgence on the middle, actually. So as Chaos moves through the choke point, we see a resurgence as Mel Gibson leads the charge of his War Dancers. And a huge Bretonian Vanguard coming in, and it looks like they're going to be making a play for the middle. So look at that. That's really cool, right? So Nurgle went to go play through the choke point, and then the Wood Elves saw them like abandoning their position in the middle a little bit, and comes in with, not abandoning, but trying to rotate, and they come in with a, a big Orion flank with a bunch of Eternal Guard, which must have been hiding in the trees right here. Looks like uh, Unsummon's going down, so very, very good domination fundamentals from both players here as the Spears continue to hold it down. 
Farside Point, going to be owned by Order. Uh, those Eternal Guard will eventually defeat those uh, very tattered Chaos Warriors there. And the middle objective has been flipped by Orion and the Fae Enchantress. Both sides have Mortis Engine, but Orion is going to be a raid boss here. He uh, causes terror. He has anti-large. Uh, he can annihilate Festus. He can just crush Flesh Hounds because he does magic damage and anti-large. So Orion is basically a hard counter against Flesh Hounds. You can see that one Javelin he threw right there. Took down like three or four Flesh Hounds and was uh, really, really good. Dude, I can't believe Orion is like doing so good. Horn of the Wild Hunt sounded the side objective, uh, looking to be owned by the Order Tide as well. And now we're starting to see the value lead that is here for the um, for the Order Tide coming into play. 12.1 and 11 against 9.3 and 8.8. .8. Yes, Nurgle does have healing, but so too to the other side. So it's really not as much of a variable, and they could be kind of canceling each other out in that regard. Now, Festus is here, but the Wild Hunter, man, he is showing no mercy. Minotaurs of Corn on their way in, and they are going to be uh, rear charging. Nope, going to be battling the uh, Grail Knights. Grail Knights with a lot of chevrons this game. I would wager they're probably a couple thousand value. Yeah, 2300 on these Grail Knights, and I believe they've been alive the entire game as well. Fae Enchantress going to be draining down. Her Mortis Engine isn't as good as Festus. I think hers is 5 to 12. Yeah, so her Mortis Engine's 8 to 16. Festus is 12 to 24. Kugath is 24 to 36, uh, which I believe is the same as the standard Mortis Engine. So, like, Kugath and the Mortis Engines have the best ones. The Fae, the Fae is, like, a very weak Mortis Engine, comparatively speaking. But over the course of a long game, it can still add up. I mean, she, she's hitting at 2100 value, but... Still, we're seeing a triple cap right now. This objective could be getting flipped. Really, really good play here from Sandwich, getting these uh, these flush hounds to come around the back and like flank on these Eternal Guard, because uh, that could be flipping for Chaos very, very quickly. But Chaos is probably going to need a triple cap. We do see some Glade Riders coming into support. The middle objective is being dominated by Orion and all these just the spears and the, the Fane Tantris supporting is really, really good. And anything that comes over here is basically just getting Waywatchered. Like every single game we've seen with, uh, with these guys so far, we've seen craziness. Yeah, the Waywatchers... I've gotten good value. Hey, Coffin, dude, thank you for the 200. The lady shot down uh, shot down painting an army for me on Etsy, so I guess I'll have to say thank you so much, man. Thank you. Holy shit, man. What army were you looking for? God, God damn, dude. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, can't thank you enough. And by the way, if you're looking, I, shoot me a message, Coffin. I, I might have a little something something uh, in that regard. I have someone who can maybe help. Shoot me a message, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the battle continues as the Order Tide continues to hold on to the middle objective. Coffin, once again, thank you so much. We're going to Applebee's tonight. Oh, that's one of my favorite stories of all time. I actually have a really good Applebee's story, which if you guys remind me at the end of this, this battle, I'll tell you the Applebee's story. Applebee's is basically like a really haggard diner, diner in the United States, if you guys are uh, needing a reference over in Europe. Um, Knights of the Realm here. Battling Flesh Hounds. Should be able to win that. Maybe even clean off this objective with some good cycle charging. But a lot of tide, there's just man tide coming in. We got Foot Squires, we got Men at Arms, and they're just avoiding the Festus Mortis Engine while the Bretonian Knights are just cleaving through these units. And 14,000 to 13,000, a really big value lead. The Cavalry are just dominating this game. And the Waywashers are getting so much value as well. It's just outstanding teamwork for sure. Outstanding teamwork. But looking on the backside, we do see Objective 3 being uh, held by, not Valkia, because she's flying and she can't hold objectives. She's sitting up there angrily looking at the flag, shaking her fist, wondering why it's not switching to her side. It's the classic conundrum. But uh, she's going to be going to battle those cavalry. And look at this, guys. Hold on a second. Could there be a little bit of treachery? The middle objective is really, really getting hotly contested. And could there be a triple cap from Chaos? I don't think they have enough for a triple cap. And here we see the Way Watchers. Look at that. So Kark saved up his resources, unsummoned his Waywatchers that were out of ammo, and then brought them back. So I think that seals the deal. Because, like, anything that tries to get this objective, guys, is just going to get karate chopped. And in the meantime, Chad Gibson in the middle held it just long enough. But the Forces of Chaos with a really, really good fourth quarter comeback. Really, really good fourth quarter comeback. And Orion and Fae Enchantress would probably get this objective back eventually as well. Like, their sustained fighting, like, as a power couple here in the middle... Ariel is probably a little bit jealous of this for sure. The Fane Chantress and Orion, the new power couple here. They would win this eventually. Like, Festus would die, um, and the Mortis Engine would clear these units off, and Nurgle would get folded. And, like, you see some units moving up on this point, but Kark sitting back here, which is some awesome Wood Elf Archer play, and just tearing apart these uh, Minotaurs of Corn. They're going to be routing, just, they're just taking turns routing, basically. And uh, that is going to be uh, Game Blouse is there. All right, so Marauders of Corn are broken. We're also going to be adding this format to the Hall of Fame. So there will be like a Grand Alliances uh, of the tournament winners and all that. So should be quite a bit fun. We'll keep some records of it. On the other side, Objective looks to be uh, held by Chaos. But a little bit of order pressure from Knights of the Realm looking to threaten that one. But there's basically no chance. And like I said, 
Orion will eventually win this point. It's just going to take some time. You can see the Mortis engine going down. This objective, Chaos trying desperately to get this, but I think they're... Oh my god, wait. They're really close to the triple cap here, guys. Oh my god, they almost had a triple cap, but it wouldn't have been sustainable, to be fair. It would not have been uh, sustainable. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, funny you say that. He is with his... She, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Thank you, guys. Great battle. That was a fun one, dude. I love seeing, like... Like, different, like, order versus... Maybe I should just... Like, man, maybe we need to switch up the Grand Alliances a little bit as well. I don't know. Like, to like to avoid the mirror matches as much. Like, having Chaos versus Chaos. I, yeah, even still. I think it's ba more balanced the way it is now. But looking at the value, guys, Way Watchers each got a ton. Orion just raid boss. He didn't get a ton of value, but he held it down. Fane Chantress. This is why Fane Chantress is good, guys. 4,000 value. And Coffin Man, thank you so much. Again... I really, really appreciate that donation. 3,800 Grail Knights Super MLG. Our participants chosen first come, first serve. There are no limits. Any number of people can sign up for this event. If we had had 100 people sign up, I'd be running a tournament all night. Applebee story. Okay. So um, it'll give you a little bit of insight into, you know, corporate America, the Applebee story. All right. Looking at the value here, what did really well for these guys? I think Platypus, is, uh, their combo is pretty good. I do. But the Waywatchers were quite exceptional here, and so too were the Grail Knights. Festus got 3,700 value. You know, there's a lot of units fighting in 2v2, so Mortises are really good. Barons of the Ball got 1,600. Very cool. Sandwich Skull Crushers didn't do as much, and uh, over here. All right. So Applebee's. Uh, basically, I used to work at a company, right? And I was not in the sales department. Like I was not in the sales department of this company. I was, um, I was in like the, f it was a sports company. So basically I ran sporting events. Uh, I would run, I was an athletic director. So I'd run, you know, basketball tournaments, track and field, um, different things like this. So I closed a partnership on my own time, like off the company dollar. I closed a partnership with a major professional sports organization. I created a relationship with them and our organization so that, um, so that we would be able to collaborate with them. And we did have some good collaborations. It was like the collaboration ended up being like you know, several hundreds of thousands of dollars in sponsorships, right? So we have our all company meeting like a couple weeks after I close this partnership. And I, I go in there and they, they, they have the, the award, the employee of the year award, right? So they pull me up to the, um, they pull me up to the front of the, uh, of the company. And I, I, I ended up getting employee of the year at this company, right? And the CEO comes up to me, he shakes my hand. And he get, he slips me a gift card, and I was like, "Oh, this is kind of cool. What is it going to be like? You know, maybe like 40, 40 or fifty bucks, whatever, to like you know, a coffee shop." But it was a ten dollar, it was a ten dollar gift card. It was a ten dollar gift card to Applebee's. I couldn't even get like a burger. The burgers were like eleven dollars on the menu. It was a ten dollar gift card. I think I, I I don't know if I ever used it, but it was a ten dollar. It was like you close like a half a million dollar deal for this company, and they give you a ten a ten dollar gift card to Applebee's. A $10 gift card to Applebee's, bro. I couldn't believe it. I was like flabbergasted. I was, I was like, you know, I was like, maybe they'll give you like a coffee shop thing. Like, I don't know, like, like a bonus, like at my job. But I got a $10 gift card to Applebee's. I was like, I was telling my friends about that at night. And I was like, straight up crying tears. I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, dude, I can't even get the burger. I can't even get the, the, the pot pie. I have to get like the chicken strips. <laughs> You're a valued employee. Holy shit. That was so funny. That was actually a big catalyst for me, like being like, I need to figure something else out. Yeah, it was pretty funny. I was like, I actually, I took it well. Though. I wasn't upset. I just thought it was really funny. I was like, I was like, okay, this is like a reality check. You know, <laughs> the CEO is just all proud handing me a $10 Applebee's gift card. Holy shit. That was the funniest part. He had like such a happy smile on his face. Yeah. Corporate America right there. Yeah, exactly. This is so sad, I know. It wasn't just employee of the month, bro. It was employee of the year. Yeah. Anyways. Hey, thank you for the donation. Welcome to corporate America. Don't spend it on Applebee's, I know. Oh, man. Yeah, it was really funny, dude. I remember that. That's one of my favorite stories of all time. That's one of my favorite stories. I'll tell it. I'll tell it to, to all who will listen. Go buy yourself something nice. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know what? What I was, you know, what I was truly envious of is that the year before, the person who got employee of the year the year before, they got a twenty five dollar gift card to Starbucks. So I really, I really got done dirty. I didn't even get the the good stuff. I got the Applebee's, which is like like a dying diner franchise chain. Anyways, guys, let's get back to the action. Hopefully, you enjoyed that. Yeah, I'd rather just not get anything. Like, a, give me like a, a firm handshake and a little plaque or something. You know, <laughs> that's fine. All right, so let's go to the bracket. And uh, where are we at? Okay, so order has advanced to the grand finals. Now, the grand finals today, guys, are best of three. They are best of three. Yeah, John, they do. They t it's a little bit, but it's, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. Um, Twitch does as well. So, okay. Undead versus Mark's Chaos. Let's go ahead and do this. And have some fun. Okay. And to be completely fair though, I like I loved the organization I worked at. It was great. But you know, it was that was like a big eye opener. Yeah. The organization, it, they they worked for a very good cause and everything. Um, okay. So where are we at? Uh we did this one. Trying not to cast the same game over and over. So that was good. Let's do that. Okay, it is the right map. Okay, so that was the correct map that we were doing here. HP Lovecraft, hopefully 20 Canadian. Hey, dude, thank you. Dude, I'll go. Get, I don't even know if we, the nearest Applebee's to me would be like an hour and a half drive, sadly. So I don't know, Lovecraft. Do you, do you want me to go to, do you want me to go to Applebee's and be driven insane and have some eldritch visions and discover some, some deep ones and old ones living in the depths? That would be for sure your vision. Applebee's is secretly uh, secretly run by by cultists of the uh, of, of Cthulhu. All right, so this is going to be uh, all right. Getting the teams all set up here, setting up the replays, and this is going to be. Let me see what team that was. Uh, all right, War S. There we go. Loading into the game, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get this party started. Let's have some fun. Thank you guys all for joining today. Jeez, I can't believe it. Lovecraft knows. So my wife is, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the Lovecraft's literature and kind of the influences that it's had on modern, you know, cinema and literature and games and everything. But my wife is like Lady Turin. She's like the most diehard Lovecraft enjoyer. Like she knows everything about it. Like all the little details. She is, she is the, the, dark, the dark queen of H.P. Lovecraft's literature. All right, there we go. Little so Howard Dean to get us going here into the next match. So it is the correct map. I don't know what I was. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm just out of it. Hmm. <laughs> Rumors that Applebee's is staffed by man-sized rats. I, I should do like an uh, American diner, like American diners, like Haggard Diners tier list. It'd be like Caro's, Applebee's, the Black Bear Diner. I'm trying to think. So if you guys are in the states. Like, what are your haggard diners? We So I'm trying to think of them all. We have Applebee's. We have the Black Bear Diner. We have Caro's. We have Denny's. I think Denny's would be, like, the gnarliest. Denny's would be the gnarliest. Oh, yeah, Jeff, for sure. Darkest Dungeon? I think she's played that. I think she's played that. Yeah. For sure. Here's $20 for the Chipotle and gas, please Chipotle. I, I actually love Chipotle a lot. When I used to work uh, work my, my athletic director job, I would just be eating Chipotle like every day. It's so good. Thank you, thank you. All right, guys. Frostlight, I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. We got a bunch of new members as well. Okay, so we got Waffle House. Chili's, yeah, Chili's is, we have Chili's here. Denny's. Uh, I Oh, IHOP is a gnarly one. I've gotten food poisoning at IHOP before. And Denny's. <laughs> Quiznos is more like Subway. It's not a diner. A diner is like old school, sit down, you know. But yeah, it's it's more old school. Okay, Danny's Waffle House. Before. I've never been to Waffle House before. I never have. Yeah, Danny's is great when you're like, you know, blitzed. <laughs> when you're just like drunk as hell. You just go to Danny's when you're in college. I would, I would probably not eat at Danny's again. Yeah. I've heard horror stories about like the kitchens at Danny's and yeah. Courtesy Diner in St. Louis. I'm getting, dude, we're getting all the pro tips. All right, guys, back to the action. Here we are. It is going to be the forces of the undead versus the forces of chaos. Hey, noobs, thank you. Caught you live. Thanks for the amazing content. Thank you, man. Thank you. 
You guys are too generous today. It's going to be Setra the Imperishable teaming up with... Who is the Vampire Lord? Is it Manfred? So the, the true power couple that would probably never exist in lore. But it's, it's easier to follow when it like aligns. Crimson95, thanks for becoming a member. Greatly appreciate it. The Dukes of Haggard are really growing in numbers today. Chuck Norris, bless you, my friend. Now, for the forces of Ghoul Baby and uh, Jasa here, it is going to be the Golden Griffin as well as the Exalted Lord of Change. On top of that, we do have Mirror Guard. We got a bunch of Slanesh infantry backed up by Zinchi and shooting. So this is pretty exciting stuff. We saw this combo earlier. It was very strong, right? It was like a, Zinch, or a Slanesh front line, which they have the best front line of the game probably, and uh, backed up by just good shooting and good magic support, which I like. Lovecraft, Red Lobster is run by the denizens of Innsmouth. It really is. It is, yeah. All the servers at Red Lobster just have this kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> a slightly fishy look to them. Yeah, they do. Goodness knows what's going on there. Oh, man, I remember eating at Red Lobster in, like, 1997. Oh, my, my goodness. I think it was last time. Lovecraft, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. You guys are just uh, you're killing it today, man. I don't know what to say. Thank you. So on the other side, Tomb Guard moving up. Nahakar Warriors, Kepra Guard. The big Undead Legion, they're going to be playing the side objective pretty heavily, but we do have these two big chickens. Not sure what the Golden Griffin of Theurgy is going to be doing in the Exalted Lord of Change, but they look like they wanted to land and do a little bit of a bully beat down there, which they totally could. Vampires are just swarming the middle. They're just going to be spreading the vampiric filth all over this middle objective. So we have the Grave Guard, Corpse Carts, Manfred. It's basically just a Vampire Tide and a Tomb King's Tide, which is very tough to clear because, to be honest, like the Zine shooting isn't going to be that good against these guys, I don't know. Yeah, like Tomb Guard are silver shielded, right? Like, and, and like the Grave Guard are silver shielded. Like, I feel like the, the shooting is going to be rough. Granted, the magic could carry. Like, getting big, like, wind spells and infernal gateways and those type of things could be really, really nice for sure. So, this objective is going to be taken by the undead. So, here we do see Subutai grabbing this point. On the top side, we see King Nikesh's Scorpion Legion. It's going to be heading on over to objective three to try and secure that. And as of now, Chaos is not contesting this point. Oh, they do get some horsemen, which is unfortunate. So they summoned it, like, they shouldn't have summoned horsemen against Silver Shielded Spears. So they're not going to be able to do a whole lot there. Legamas Cracker, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yes. Let the semifinals flow through you. Exalted Lord of Change, going to be hunting down your boy Manfred von Baldstein here, but he is too fast, too bald, and too angry. And he is going to be able to avoid that. So he gets away from those bad boys. And yeah, you know, the, the Chaos Gods are going to be able to hold on to these objectives here for sure, but, like, they're going to have to, uh, they're going to have to, you know, get aggressive here. Although I think the Tomb Kings are going to pull the trigger soon. Cetra is basically just absorbing the ammo of those units. You see this? This is uh, currently being controlled by Houseplant. So Houseplant just juking back and forth. And he's wasting all the blue ammunition on those blues. So then he can move his skeletons up and, you know, live his best life here. Yeah, Tomb Kings do have low armor. So maybe the shooting won't be as bad as I perhaps speculated. You certainly make a very, very good point. So we do see Cetra pulling back. The thing about Cetra, guys, is normally he can't be, he like, you know, doesn't have access to super crazy healing. But even if you're trying to nuke Cetra, who's a very tanky character, Manfred is going to be able to heal him, which is something you need to be taken into account. So the undead do have two objectives very loosely held on the far side. I would actually really like Chaos to send like a good quality Slanesh infantry unit over here, like send a Chaos Warrior of Slanesh, who'd be able to easily wrestle that objective. I think that would be a really, really strong power play. Um, and then you just kind of skirmish and fight in the middle a little bit. But the Tomb Kings... Look like they're going to be moving up. So we do see the forces of the undead preparing to advance on Chaos. And it is going to be Tomb Guard, Tomb Guard, and the Nehkar Warriors. On the backside of things, we do see the undead legion of Subutai preparing for the dreaded mouth-breathing grind. And it looks like the Winds of Death going down as well. That's going to be a nice one. That's going to hit a lot of devoted marauders. Oh, KOs those ones. And gets right through the Severed Claw, but they have a low model count. But it also hit the Skell Scourges. And we do see a Pit of Shades as well in Zombies. So, not the best pit of shades. Should have waited for the Grave Guard to pile in a little bit before using it, but it's not the end of the world. Um, that Winds of Death certainly was a little bit stronger because it took down some Chaos Warrior action. Now, will the Tomb Kings be able to grind this objective down? We do see the Conic Sign Stalkers. We see Tomb Guard uh, moving up to battle against Devoted Marauders, which they will win. Um, Tomb Guard lose the Chaos Warriors, but against Devoted Marauders, they should win pretty decisively. And their big Tower Silver Shields and 55 Armor is able to mitigate most of the effectiveness of these, uh, these poor little Devoted Marauders here or excuse me, Blue Horrors, and uh, honestly, the Tomb Guard are going to have a turbo cost-effective fight here, and look at this, guys. I like this. We get the um, we get the Corpse Cart with the Unholy Lodestone moving up. Oh, that's so, that's so cool. So the Corpse Cart's going to be buffing the Tomb King's units, which is very strong, and when the Blues run out of ammo, there's not going to be much of an answer to them. As far as the middle goes, we have a big, ugly blob fight in the trees. Uh, we have Setra battling here. It looks like he's being targeted by the Zichian Chickens, so we do have the Golden Griffin of Theurgy attacking. Uh, Narcissism active from Slanesh as well. 
So the Zeech Slanesh tag team is going down, but Manfred flying over and uh, looking to support his boy. I'd wager there's going to be an invocation going down. They're going for a full-on gooning attempt, ladies and gentlemen. Full-on gooning attempt. The Big Bird, the Exalted Lord of Trains, trying to take down Setra. Setra also being beaten on by Prince Sigvald. There are Screamers of Zeech, but it looks like Setra does get away. That was a much better, uh, better Pit of Shades coming in from our Slanesh player, Fajasa, there. That was very nice. Hitting uh, the Grave Guard there, kind of crumbling them down and leaving these units a little bit isolated. But Setra escapes from his uh, cage here. He does get Invocation, which is going to be healing him up quite a bit. So he's going to get probably just over 1,000 HP back as he does battle this giant chicken in the Shadow Realm here. Now, as far as the side point goes, King Nikesh's Scorpion Legion just holding on to that one pretty comfortably. But more Undead and more Tomb Kings are on their way in. And it looks like a very similar strategy. It, it's funny how the builds didn't change that much. Like, there were slight nuances to the builds, but, like, they still have, like, the same... Most of them use, like, the same Lord, like, every time, right? So, um, we do see Mortis Engine moving in to try and get a little bit of drain going down over here. And on Objective 1, uh, still being held by the Undead. Yeah, so the Tomb Guard, like I said, it just absolutely wrecked the Marauders and it can absorb the shooting all day. So, Tomb Guard are a very, very good unit. And when you get the Corpse Guard support, it's going to be giving them uh, passive healing, which is insane on Tomb Guard. And you also get the Vigor Mortis. So, the Vigor Mortis gives them 5 melee attack, 5 melee defense, and, uh, and Vigor Replenishment. So, I love the Corpse Guard teaming up with, like, the good quality Tomb King's infantry. That seems very nice. But, like, the battle isn't terribly dynamic. Like, most of what's going down is just, like, right here. This is, like, a big decisive factor. Which is, the Undead want a blob fight. They just want to grind. I mean, Chaos is very grindy. Slanesh can grind well. But not, like, the Mortis Engine is, is on a whole nother level there. We do get a Pink Fire going down. Manfred, you know, vampires are strong fighters, even on their little health seeds. Like, Manfred has 480 weapons rank. So if the Golden Griffin up here isn't careful, Manfred could unleash his full fury and get some work done. Oh, Sneaky Snake's getting laser beams. Shooting up into the sky here. It looks like there's going to be another invocation going down on Cetro. Looks like there maybe was. He's on fire right now, so you want to wait for that to wear off. You see a Pit of Shades going down. And uh, yeah, the Mortis still just bumping and grinding, though. Another Winds of Death blasting through. This is like the Doomed Forest, dude. Like, look at the fighting here. It's just like, just absolute carnage. As we just see magic and, and undead and warriors of chaos just, uh, just littering the battlefield, essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely for sure. Now, once again, Manfred doing great work up in the sky. Really good teamwork here. It looks like Subutai and Houseplant made a call right here to get some uh, good DAC into the Golden Griffin of Theurgy. A little bit of a micro blunder here by Ghoul Baby. He definitely needs to get this away. There's no sense in fighting right here. But it uh, looks like the Golden Griffin could get karate chopped by Manfred. Zinch army ability going down does kind of tickle those Tomb Guard Halberds and forces the Eyes of the Desert back. But overall, Manfred was able to get that Golden Griffin very low to the point where it could uh, potentially die a little bit later in the game. Now back here on this side, we see Tomb Guard fighting. Tomb Guard going to be backed up by the Corpse Cart with the Unholy Lodestone and a lot of Tomb King's infantry. Overall, this whole engagement over here seems very decisive for the Tomb Kings and for the Undead. The Corpse Cart just buffing up those Tomb King's troopers is, uh, is, is so, so cool to see. Now, a bit of a mobility fight on the far side. It looks like Chaos made a little bit of an ambitious play for it. They sent some Rotter Horsemen, but the forces of the Tomb Kings were able to respond with some Netakara Warriors. We got Grave Guard and Cryptors being sent over there. So the OP Hellstriders of Slanesh not going to be finding uh, too much of a mark here as they are going to get taken apart by just and drowned in bodies of the undead, basically. So, yeah, looking pretty bleak for those guys. Now, looking at the value in this game, it looks like Houseplant and Subutai are up, uh, which is very bleak for the forces of Chaos, considering that there's so much healing as well on the undead. It's only going to make it worse. And the Eyes of the Desert once again shooting at the Exalted Lord of Change up in the sky. The Golden Griffin pulling back. Manfred just kind of chilling. Narcissism did snare him in place. So it kept him locked down and from finishing off the Exalted Lord of Change. But those snake laser beam eyes coming in from the Sepulchral Stalkers have just been MVP. Cetra's still going. And you guys want to know some crazy shit? Look at the lair. Look. No, this, is, this isn't a replay. It's Master. Look at the, the amount of buffs on Cetra. Master of the Dead. Mortis Engine Healing. Balefire Corpse Cart. Vigor Mortis from Corpse Cart. Just like, dude is just getting jacked. And he's getting just so many heals. Like, passive healing, like, making Cetra such a raid boss. Really, really synergizing quite well. Black Knights with Lance is coming in. The dreaded Subutai finisher. We've seen Subutai finish games with Black Knights. Usually when they come out, you know the game is starting to, you know, go the way of the Undead here. So Undead have a triple cap. We see the uh, Black Knights coming in. Lance is couched for, uh, for the night, I guess. And what are the blue ball there? They, like, charge and then they stopped. Oh, they're, they're peeling around. They're wheeling around to go after the Flamers, which is uh, definitely a much better idea. These Hagger and Akira Warriors might even be able to finish those guys off. So another Pit of Shades going down. Still taking this fight here. Sigvald is pretty grindy, but the thing is, uh, Sigvald will get his butt kicked by Cetra. Cetra will run over Sigvald all day on either his Chariot or his uh, Big Horseman. So, you know, Sigvald's tanky, but that's going to be a tap out there. GG, well played, guys. Cetra is truly imperishable with that combo. It is. Yeah, GG, well played. Very, very, you know, grindy game, but 
This is going to be a very, very interesting grand finals, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to see, I believe, let's look at the brackets real quick, just to confirm. It is going to be the Undead versus Order. So it's going to be Bretonia Wood Elves versus uh, Vampire Counts and Tomb Kings. Now, is the isolating fire of the Wood Elves going to be able to deal with these like big threats that we're seeing? I don't know, man. I suppose it depends on the map. Maps will be a big variable as well. It's a cool game, man. Lots of lots of complimenting buffs. Bretonia and Wood Elves versus the Undead, yes. Now, taking a look here at Manfred. 4,000 value Manfred. Winds of Death and just pure combat efficiency. Crazy how good Vampire Counts Lords are, right? Supersize Mort Ascension also got almost 2,000 value. I mean, that's amazing, right? And looking here, 2,000 value from Houseplant's uh, Sepulchral Stalker Sniping. Cetra also, not a ton of value, but he was he was a sponge. He absorbed a lot of damage, and the Tomb King's Infantry really gave good sustainability for sure. Noah says, turn, looks like uh, Zinch player went to Elite and did Perhaps so. He had two, yeah, this, that's what happened to me when I played Empire earlier. I didn't have enough units, to, things to resummon. Yeah, it was happening to me quite a bit. So I think, yeah, in 2v2, you got to account for that. I like the goon squad, though. Like, I like the principle of what Ghoul Baby was going for. Like, having the two big birds that could kill vampire lords and goon them, I like the idea, but it just didn't work out because of how elusive Manfred is and the support that they had. Like, that seems like a cool combo. Like, Zinch and Slanesh, you can get, like, narcissism and the Slaneshi rampages and snares and really snipe things with, like, goon squads. I do like that quite a bit. Yeah. GG well played, guys. GG well played. All right, so let's uh, let's keep let's keep the old machine going, ladies and gentlemen, as we will be setting up the next game here, and uh, let's do it. All right, so I just need to get the uh, replays together for the grand finals. So we casted that one. All right, one second. Let's do this. Just give me a hot minute here, and we uh, we'll get this all squared away. All right, so one sec. Going here. Where are they at? All right. Perfect, perfect. Looks like the players have it. So this is best of three, guys. So you're going to be getting a little bit more action here. I'll collect feedback. If people would prefer to do best of one grand finals in the future, we can totally do that. But we will uh, we will definitely, definitely get some feedback after this. Because I like the thematic element of the format. I think it makes it better. Like if you just had like Empire with like Skaven and shit or like Empire with Warriors of Chaos, I think you lose some of the fun of this event. I think 2v2 is much more fun to watch when there's like some thematic structure to it. Just my two cents. I don't know if you guys agree, but yes. Sure, King of the Dead. What do, what do you got for me, man? I'm ready. I'm ready for the, the trolling. I stand ready. Okay, so jumping back. And let's get this. We have Order versus Undead. And let us go ahead and load in. Let's have some fun, man. Let us have some fun. So again, this is best of three. There's going to be some uh, potentially knockdown drag out fights here. And I'm going to just refill my water real quick, guys. I'll be back in just a second, and we will uh, be getting started with the grand finals. Yeah, Reginald, well, bounce is, uh, yeah, bounce is always going to be an issue, but, you know, it's all good. I Like, we'll, we'll see. We'll see who ends up uh, getting it, you know? Now, I think it's too early to draw conclusions about like the overall balance being a complete, I mean, yeah, there are some alliances that are much weaker. Like there's some, like destruction feels really bad. Like the green skin one, that feels really bad with ogres. <laughs> but uh, we'll get to it. Anyways, guys, I'll be right back. And uh, GG, <laughs> that's pretty funny, Jeff. I love it. More Lord of Death, keep our souls, lest they fall prey to him. <laughs>
All right, guys, let's get this party started. Going to be loading into the finals here in just a moment. Puggington saying bounce is not a... Yeah, it's a casual event for sure. But I'm curious what combinations Puggington do you think are unbeatable? Like Puggington, do you think that the undead combo we're seeing here today, for example, is unbeatable? Or like what, which ones do you think would be like just... Not, I feel like there's an answer for everything. Like there's going to be some that are inherently stronger, like much stronger, like almost unbeatable. But I feel like with how much range of factions we have in this game... There's always going to be something that can beat it. Like, they will always find a way. That's kind of how the meta is in general, unless we're talking Slanesh in 1v1. But in general, I feel like everything has an answer. Like, somewhere deep down there, if you theorycraft hard enough, you're going to find a way to beat it. But again, you don't know what you're going to face, so... Uh, thank you so much, Jankuya Bardzo Venrel. I hope you are having a, a very Dobja day, my friend. And uh, let me just get the nameplate set up. All right, so this is going to be... Uh, and... Good. Sorry, I'm trying to get their name right. I don't want to like screw it up. Versus. The... Okay. Looking good there. And awesome. I think we're all set. All right. So Reginald Puggington. Let's let's see let's see if you're correct that they're unbeatable. So Reginald Puggington predicting that vampire counts and tomb kings are uh, unbeatable. We will see. I guess it would be really broken. You guessed it would be really broken before the event starts. Hey, man, let's see if you're right. Let's see if they win the tournament. And remember, this is best of three as well. So at the least, there's uh, at the very least, there's going to be two games. Okay, so loading in here. Uh, that looks good. Hey, Old Liver Rivers. Thanks for becoming a member. Welcome, welcome. All right. So the first battle here is going to be on Nuln Outskirts. Now, this map does have a capturable tower, which is pretty fun. It doesn't do much damage, but it's it's kind of a f interesting thing for, like, casual tournaments, right, to experiment with these type of things. Okay. And, you know, this will this will be an interesting test to your theory, Reggie, too, because this is these are, like, some of the best players in the world. Like, I think all four of these guys are top 16 in the entire world in competitive. Like, piloting these lists. So we are going to see. We're going to see. Like, this is like a good... You can't say, like, oh, one side's worse than the other, so it doesn't, like, mean much. Like that. But, like, yeah. These are, like, some of the best players in the entire world. So, so we got Bretonia and Wood Elves, which you would think don't have, like, any super crazy synergies, but they do address the weaknesses. Like, Bretonia... Wood Elves have always been very weak against, like, Heavy Cav, and Bretonia can really defend the Wood Elf Archers, which I think is very, very strong. Very, very strong. And obviously the Undead have a ton of synergies with healing and these different variables and whatnot. So yeah, they can get it done. So ladies and gentlemen, Way Watchers coming up. So we got four Way Watchers, Mel Gibson once again. And it uh, looks like a Grail Relic box. Oh, look at that. So we got the Grail Relic. We have the uh, Fae Enchantress. And we do also have any other heroes. Nope, it's just going to be uh, Grail Knights, dude. This guy and his Grail Knights. I love it. Really glad it's not a mirror match for the final Me Too. I was very nervous about it. I was very, very nervous. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really of the opinion that I think any build can be beaten. Like, any any combination can be beaten. There's going to be counters to, like, every kind of style. And, it, like, even if you find, like, something really abusive, I think there's something within the 23 factions we have, like, combining them, that can beat them. Granted, there's some alliances, which I think just would have very bleak chances. Um, so I might have to restructure the alliances, but I want to keep them in flavor, you know? It's like ogres and, and greenskins are kind of hard to, like, plug in. I have an ogre mercenary faction. Ogres have um, the ability in the Grand Alliance format to ally with anybody. So it, anybody that's not Chaos, you can put Ogres with. So they can like go with Lizardmen, they can go with whatever. Now, looking here at the Forces of the Undead, it's going to be very much more of what we've seen. We have Grand Hero from Katep, Skeleton Spearmen, we have Tomb Guard as well, an Unholy Legion of Undead, who shop the Great Bows in the back to just you know put some Jack into the Bretonian Knights, and Heinrich Kemmler coming out of the bushes. Heinrich Kemmler in the bushes as well, backed up with the Double White Kings. So the White Kings are emerging. And uh, yeah, the battle is now on. We see the, the box with the Grail Relic. I love it. The height, the tower is going to be taken by Orion. Look at this. Orion, the, the true Chad. The tower doesn't do that much damage, though. It, it, it did when the map first got made, but it got nerfed where it's basically just like an archer shot. It's like a like a haggard couple arrows shoot at you. It's really not that. But it, over the course of a game, it can probably get you like 800 value or something, which isn't insignificant in a close battle, but... Yeah, so the objectives are going to be two. We have objective three, and we have objective one back here as well. So the capturable tower is going to be opening up. Orion's going to grab that. And you'll see it start to shoot some uh, little arrows right here. So here it comes. I think it will shoot. Yeah, you can see the range. It, it kind of covers the middle of the battlefield. 
But again, it really doesn't do too much. The objective is being grabbed by the champions of, uh, of order, champions of Korea as well. And we do see the Grail Knights moving in. Grail Knights getting a big thunderous charge into the Tomb Guard. Oh my god, look at, look at that! They just straight up go through those units! Oh my god, the Lance Formation is brutal! Look at that! I'm so happy that it works like that now. It brings me such joy. True Bretonian, dude, his Cav Micro is pretty nuts. He's just like, rear, he's like rear charging Halberds. Look at that! He's doing so much and he rear charges those Spears. His Cavalry are just feasting like the Heathen Kings of old. It's absolutely insane. We get a Forest Dragon as well. So we have a wild-ass Forest Dragon coming in from the Wood Elves. Just some weird shit on both sides, that is for sure. Well, more so on the, on the Order side. Heinrich Kemmler getting popped in the face. The two Waywatchers just absolutely nuke him. Absolutely nuke him. He better be careful. Vampire Counts are not a faction that can afford to lose their Lord. So Subutai is going to be pulling back it around, trying to stabilize his Lord, and it looks like he's going to be able to. Good counterplay by Subutai as well. He does get the White King back here. White King's going to be hunting those units down. And the high ground objective is going to be grabbed by the forces of uh, order, it looks like. So we got the Halberds, we got the Grail Relic, and they could be threatening a triple cap here. Granted, the Undead is, is barely being held in its cage here. They're eventually going to move out. Grail Knights are a little bit stuck in, uh, in, in combat now, though, so it's going to be painful for them. Granted, they are fighting Cryptors, which means even though they're going down here, they are going to be accruing some decent value. And uh, in the backfield, we see Eyes of the Desert, Eyes of the Desert, the Arawar. Big scary snake boys going to be battling Grail Knights. Grail Knights get the favor of the Fae as well as Regrowth, so that should help them uh, do glorious battle against these uh, these undead and potentially get the W in that skirmish. So we got a triple cap coming out for the forces of order at this point. But again, value trading is relatively even. You can see a slight advantage for order, but with the undead healing from the lore passives, it's, it, it can be nullified pretty easily. And Bretoni just, again, just chilling on these points. Knights Errant coming out, slamming into these forces. The Undead still moving up slowly but surely. We got Tomb Guard as well as Skeleton Warriors. Heinrich Kemmler. Oh, is Krell out? No, it's not Krell. It's, it's the Forest Dragon. I kind of like the Forest Dragon as a tech to, um, to take down the White King. I think that's really cool. Yeah, like to goon those like annoying undead like foot single entities. Like having that magic damage Forest Dragon against like Banshees and whatever, like Necromancers. Oh, he's got a second Forest Dragon. So Kark is all Waywatchers, guys, and then like big Forest Dragon. That's pretty much what he's rocking. Orion is finally emerging from the hills. He hasn't been in battle yet. Orion was like captured this tower, and now he's like running all the way down here. Looks like a Spearman at Arms was left up there, but this bottom objective is going to be flipping for the undead, it looks like. They have the Tomb Guard. Uh, they have the uh, basic skeletons. They have the White King there. Heinrich Kemmler also providing a little bit of capture weight. And the Tomb Kings are going to be moving up with a lot of these uh, these Halberds and Elite units, which will start to get the momentum back. You have to also remember, you know, Vampire Counts are one of the best cap factions in the game also. Uh, they have cavalry that are great quality and can also be healed. So the Knights of Red Keep, it looks like they dispatched the Bretonian Knights in a big fight between the Knights Errant and the Blood Knights. Talk about a mismatch. The Blood Knights are going to be dragging down these Knights Errant super hard, but very, very cool thematic engagement right there. As we do see the, uh, the boys kind of getting dragged down, those Knights of the Realm. Fane Chantress Mortis obviously will be quite good. Waywatcher is constantly being hunted by Subutai's uh, White King. I really, really like that play. It's like kind of slowly picking off Waywatcher models and reducing the damage. But the Order Tide holding on to a 2-cap here. Some of the Waywatchers do get good concave fire on the Sepulchral Stalkers. The Dreaded Houseplant, the Inexorable One, continuing to push forward with his Undead Legions and casting uh, pretty cost-effective spells, which uh, does give the Restless Dead passive to the Vampire Counts, which is just insane. That is a really, really strong combo. But Eternal Guard moving on up, and we do see the Waywatchers... Picking them off and uh, picking off the Sepulchral Stalkers back here. The two objectives being held by the Order Tide, but they're slowly being pushed back. And the value is being pulled more and more even by the Undead. And with their healing taken into account from the Lore Passive from Grand Herefric Katep, uh, the Vampire Counts are getting a shit ton of healing. It's actually pretty bananas. It's going to be very, very tough for the Order Tide to overcome. Like, they could get pushed back. Granted, they have a pretty big lead right now. We do see the White King uh, being taken down by uh, Mel Gibson. So Mel Gibson getting in there with his giant spear. And he's definitely going to be dragging down this, uh, this White King. The anti-large, White King's on a horse, what's not to love? True Bretonian going to be getting his Knights of the Realm through, trying to penetrate in, but the Undead still pressing up with a lot of stuff. In the backfield, though, looks like Ushapti Grapos are taken down by some Knights Errant, which is very good. Knights Errant are a very cheap unit, and uh, the Dire Pack should be able to dispatch them though, with some Nekar Horsemen, but not before these guys start to crumble. Yeah, Ushapti Grapos being taken down. One Forest Dragon's a little bit trapped up. Pretty unfortunate for the Hardwood back here. One of the Forest Dragons did get tar pitted by three Cryptors, but it's... Uh, Best of best of three. Yeah, you want more games? Actually, this is best of three. Yes, it is best of three. But this forest dragon's getting absolutely just swamped by these units. You see the cryptor just circle beating this thing into the shadow realm. So that's a, a big value loss for sure. That was one of Kark's big investments. Fane Chancer is still more engineering it down. It looks like Heinrich Kemmler supporting his troopers as well. He does have his chaos tomb blade. So Heinrich Kemmler has like an AOE healing thing for his fellow undead. 
And the Fanchancer is a little bit trapped up here. I think Heinrich Kemmler is maybe a slightly stronger fighter, although they're pretty close. Yeah, 38-45, yeah. So they're very much in the same ballpark. But the Fanchancer is uh, very elusive here, going to be able to get away. So the Undead have taken two objectives back. Now, the problem for the Order Tide is once the Undead get a nice stranglehold, it's going to be tough to get those back. You can see Kark calling in the big guns in the back, so he does get the Waywatchers here. And the Waywatchers are just blasting into Heinrich. Uh, Heinrich trying to hunt down the Fane Chanters. Very risky to extend like this. If he was in open field, he could definitely get pops. Other Forest Dragon trying to take down Kotep. You know, I would have liked to have maybe seen that earlier. See the two um, Forest Dragons try and take down Kotep. He's pretty fresh fish. I mean, he's weak to fire, definitely pretty vulnerable, and uh, could take some work. Hey, John. And uh, is the objective flipping back? Hard to tell. Knights of the Realm coming back in. Heinrich Kemmler a little bit surrounded. This could be the turning of the tide. If the mighty Necromancer does go down, it's going to be cutting part of the, the... I would say it does, yes, metaphorically cuts the head off the snake, but vampire counts are strong enough that they're more like a Hydra. They have a bunch of heads, you know, via scary threats on the battlefield. But 24 leadership. Looks like he's going to be able to squeak away with the White King kind of supporting him. Forest Dragon tech, really interesting. But I can't help but think maybe the Forest Dragon's are one of the reasons why they're losing some momentum on the ground. We saw them in previous games using like Eternal Guard and some infantry, all that sort of stuff. And uh, wait a second. Oh my God, for some for a moment, I thought I was muted the entire game. Although you guys would have been saying more in chat. So I got uh, I got awfully surprised there, yes. So that White King, not quite killed by Orion yet, which is very strange. He's kind of chilling here, dragging down some Grave Guard, but not what he wants to be doing. And will they be able to take these uh, take these objectives back from the cold, dead clutches of the undead? It's certainly not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination. That little tower up there, still shooting. So you can see the uh, fort tower. It has pretty good range. It is shooting down into the various undead forces. I believe you can give it a target as well. So you could have it just like shoot it in shop the great or whatever. But it's... Uh... Oh, Chalice of Potions coming down. Big Chalice of Potions. Hits zombies. Hits Tomb Guard Halberds. And it does support the Men at Arms with Pole Arms, which inevitably you're going to be losing this fight. But the Grail Relic is holding back several uh, pretty good quality units. We will have to see. Defenders of Flare to Leap, just bouncing around, running into the back of the Sternsman here. Arrow Towers, you can see they're shooting and, uh, you know, slowly maybe picking off a model here and there. But the Undead are going for the dreaded Triple Cap. So they're going to be moving to the back objective. And the Undead now have equal value with the Forces of uh, Order, which is not good. That is really, really not good. That's probably the beginning of the end because with the healing being taken into account, they're just actually quite substantially behind. If you're playing Wood Elves here, you're going to need like some big Waywatcher snipes. You're going to need some plays like that to really, really get this game. For sure. Yeah, a lot of games where I don't know it's uh, where, where I don't know the, the screen blockers on. It's just uh, it's a signature here on the channel. But Order trying to fight for this objective. Here we do see a little bit of pressure actually. So we do see the defenders of Flair Lee and some Glade Riders trying to steal this, but... Crypt Horrors, Sternsman coming in, Tomb Guard Halberds basically going to be nullifying that effective push. And on the backside, we do see the Towers continuing to get some Daka, you know, slowly wearing down the Undead. And Eternal Guard do come in and salvage this, so maybe there is going to be a little bit of an opportunity. We'll have to see. So yeah, the big Tower picking off these guys. I would love to like actually look at the damage that's being done. Dude, that Lore of Nagakara passive healing like, like Sternsman and those type of units is so nasty. But yeah, Order's going to be holding on to the back objective. So there's still a glimmer of hope, guys. They have a big point lead. And it looks like this objective is starting to switch back as well. I believe Heinrich Kemmler got unsummoned. I didn't see it, but I would expect that to be the case. So this one's going to be flipping back, ladies and gentlemen, unless the undead gets some reinforcements here quickly. You can see that Kark is going to be using these Glade Riders and kind of uh, pushing back the forces of the undead, making sure they can't get up to the point. Waywatchers are online, and they're shooting at uh, Grand Hierophant Concepts. So trying to get rid of the caster and get rid of the lords. And getting them off the battlefield would be effective. It would get rid of a massive amount of healing that the Tomb Kings are bringing to the battle. As we do see some Knights of the Realm thinking about going after Kotep. They could probably crumble him. He only has 40 armor, so he, he pretty much dies to a stiff breeze if he does get surrounded and circle beaten. Top objective, owned by the Order Tide. We see some Bretonian Grail Knights coming back here to clean off the uh, chaff. It looks like some Blood Knights made their way up here. I, th I don't know, actually know who wins in a straight fight between Grail Knights and Blood Knights. I think Grail Knights have a slight edge because I think they have the physical resist, which the Blood Knights have the missile resist, so I think it's going to be favoring them and the perfect vigor as well. It depends on what point in the game you're talking about. You need the keys? Yeah, they're, they're new ones. Hold on a sec, guys. Getting the wife some keys. All right. So, back in business, we see the uh, knights running down the blood knights, and the back objective is being held onto right there. Objective three has been taken back by the order tide guys, and they're over a thousand points. This could very much be a situation where a triple cap's coming into play. Look, Heinrich Kemmler's back. It's very much like a, a like a lore thing. Like he would get close to death, and then he would flee, and then he would just come back cackling and just causing problems. But Andre Kemmler has returned to the battlefield, and we do see the Forest Dragon and Orion kind of finding here a very very messy blob. But you can see there's a ton of action going on. 
as the Fae Enchantress Mortis Engine, draining down a lot of these units. Heinrich Kemmler, though, is very dangerous close to Orion. Orion could definitely bully him if he uh, chooses to turn around and start shanking. Looks like the Forest Dragon's going to be getting hit with a regrowth, but the Order Tide looks like they're going to be losing this objective once again. They're going to be losing it once again. Blood Knights actually win that. That'd be an interesting one to test. That'd be a really, really interesting one. I feel like Grail Knights might have the advantage, right? Because the physical resist is so big. It's like... But Blood Knights have, I think, their anti-large might be a little bit bigger. I think theirs is like 18 or something. Yeah. Hard to say. So this objective taken by the Undead. Uh, a lot of units that need to be unsummoned here from Kark. Top objective is going to be flipped by the Undead. And the constant pressure all over the battlefield from the uh, just swarms of just healing and healing undeads with the Lord of Nagakara passive and the Vampire Counts proving to be really, really nasty. And this could be a very, very tough triple cap to come back from. I mean, the Order Tide does have a little bit of a lead, but they can't win on just one objective at this point. They're going to need two. And getting two back from these guys is going to be a very, very tall order. The Grail Knights charging in, or Knights of the Realm, into the Sneaky Snakes here. And they are able to get some of those guys down. And the Forest Dragon takes down DJ Kotep, actually killing the Lord of the Tomb Kings. So uh, Houseplant didn't have an opportunity to unsummon him, which means that the uh, Tomb King's army is going to be getting negative 16 leadership across the entire board. But Subutai's value is pretty insane. He's got 16.2. Houseplant has 14,000. Uh, they have eclipsed the value of the Order Tide, which is really, really bleak. Um, so the Order Tide is just straight up fighting with smaller armies. Some of the Chad Bertoni Knights coming back in trying to salvage the situation. We do see the Grail Knights fighting here and more Knights Errant. And we do see the uh, Forest Dragon getting a decent little breath attack there, crumbling down some of these units. But they would need to get two objectives uh, very, very soon. Very, very soon. So Knights of the Realm charging into the Graveguard here. Fae Enchantress moving up towards objective number one. And uh, yeah, still just no dice for the Order Tide getting the low ground. As Orion tries his best. And it'll be really interesting to see as we go to the next game what sort of tech switches we could see. I don't think the Order Tide has too many chances at this point, I mean, they're going to get this one back, and they do have that points lead, but not by much anymore. The tower was actually taken by the Vampire Count. So the Vampire Counts, look at that. They sent the Dire Pack up to the high ground and ninja the little Daka Tower there. The Forest Dragon tech is very interesting, though. Very, very interesting. Grail Knights here have earned a lot of chevrons. Holy shit, look at the chevrons on these Grail Knights. The true Bertonian's Cab Micro is pretty insane, like seeing what he does with them. Oh my god, 4,000 value on these Grail Knights, guys. 4,000 value. That is absolutely nuts. So low ground, controlled by the undead. The Order Tide manages to wrestle its home objective back. And every time I think that they're out, they just come back with like some crazy momentum and are able to kind of start threatening these objectives. Yeah, this is a pretty crazy, man. Here they come. Charging into the Crypt Tours here. We do see some Knights of the Realm trying to intercept the Eyes of the Desert. And they'll do a good damage to them, but Eyes of the Desert are Halberd Snakes. So they are uh, they're going to be able to kind of hold it down here. Will the Order Tide get this objective? I don't think so. We see Nekar Warriors coming in, but True Bretonian coming down from the rafters with a big, big charge running over the Nekar Warriors, instantly chunking them down to like 40%. There's nothing like a good Bretonian cab charge. There's nothing like it. Somebody in chat asking, uh, I did play today, but my team lost. We didn't make it to the finals. Yeah, we, we played Empire and Cathay, which was honestly didn't seem to have too much energy. <laughs> like it wasn't bad, but you know, it was it was a scrappy one. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, we see the undead holding on to the points. The true Bretonian and his uh, and the mighty Kark trying to get the Forest Dragon and Glade Riders up to the point. But the undead seem to have good control over these two uh, points here. In the backfield, we see more Knights Errant coming out. Fae Enchantress routing two is really, really rough. The fact that she got beat up somewhere, I don't know what got her, but oh my god. Fae Enchantress with 4,000 value again. She's such a good character, especially in these bigger fights. Forest Dragon breath attack. Defenders of Flare to Lee coming in for the kill. I mean, if they could man maybe somehow swing an objective, they might still have a chance in this game. It's going to be very, very close. Orion fighting here, the, the Lord of the Wild Hunt. He's not quite healing caps. Orion does heal himself. And the Undead are kind of looking a little bit worse for wear down here. But the double corpse cart, a full health unit of Nehekara Warriors, that is going to be a very, very tricky pickle. Waywatcher is going to be able to clear out some, but Waywatchers aren't like super effective at clearing out like zombies and things like that. I mean, in terms of like ammunition efficiency... And in order for the Order Tide to win, they really needed to get this push here. They needed to get all their cab and somehow take control of that objective. But it does not look like it's going to be the case as the Arrow Tower continues to uh, keep shooting here. So, yeah, still getting a little bit of Dak into the Grave Guard here. Some Spheres moving in. Forest Dragon holding its own. But, guys, I think the forces of evil, the undead, appear to have claimed victory. And it's going to be heralded by the fall of uh, the great Lord of the Wild Hunt, as I think Orion's going to be falling to just a swarm of undead here. He's very low. He's got 121 HP. Dude, he's just healing through it like a raid boss. But Orion does fall to the Chaos Tomb Blade. And with that, the hopes and dreams of the Order Tide in Game 1 is going to be diminishing.
So, so far, the dreaded Puggington theory is correct, but this is just game one. Will the undead prove to, prove to be truly unbeatable? As some folks in chat have said. Find out as we load into the next match here. All right, so let's take a look at the breakdown, guys. Let's take a look. Okay. So looking at the Waywatcher value of this game, how'd it do? Are they going to switch it? 1,700, 15, and 14. I think some of them were summoned twice. Orion was a raid boss for sure. He got 2,900 value. He was really good. Force Dragons also didn't do bad. Look at that. 25 and 27. Shit. So what are these weird builds that are coming out of uh, of Kark's mind here? Bretonian Cavalry, 4,000 on one Grail Knight. The other one didn't have as good of a time. The Fane Chantress, 3,900. Knights of the Realm obviously did good. Value trading wasn't bad. It's just the undead kind of outlasted them. I feel like you need to get more punishment on the undead. Take advantage of their usual lack of range, except there's Tomb Kings now, so it becomes even scarier. But yeah, I'm really curious to see what adjustments get made here in the next match, as that is going to be a one. Oh, in this best of three. So I, sorry, I forgot to change that. I should say best of three. And uh, for the glue eaters, for the undead. All right, very good. Master and good Dogecoin, such a funny name. Okay. So where are we at? Let's go ahead and get ready for the next game here. And this best of three. Now, if the Order Tide loses this game, it's just straight up over. Uh, it's going to be the end of the road. So let's get this. And what map are we on now? Okay. So it looks like we're going to be on the road to Vol's Anvil. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So loading into the game, guys. Some people in chat, I see some despair. Some people are saying Undead Alliance just has way too much synergy. How could Order possibly hang with the OP Undead? Well, let's find out. Kark switching it up, going hardcore with the infantry spam. Look at that. That's a big change. So no longer is he going to be going with the missiles. I like the best of three here in the finals. You get to see some adjustments from these really, really high level players and get to see how they, you know, think they can adjust and win. Yeah, very fun. So mass war dancer rush with Orion once again to be spamming the horn of the wild hunt. We saw Orion as a raid boss. He got like 4,000 value and was super hard to kill. So Orion is great. Badger Knight, super entertaining tournament. Hey, I'm glad you think so. Thank you so much, Badger. It means a lot, man. You guys are out of control today, man. Thank you, thank you. And we don't see much adjustment from Houseplant. Obviously, if it works, why try and fix it? You know, if this game were to go south for them, he would have the opportunity to then adjust to what they just lost you, right? So yeah, it is on. Badger, thank you so much. So we got mass uh, word answers. It's going to be three of those. We do also have Orion. And what adjustments did the Bretonian make? Uh, the Bretonian player actually got better infantry quality. They got Battle Pilgrims. Look at that. So we got Battle Pilgrims into the sunset. Blade Singers, Fey Enchantress, and once again, Grail Knights. I love that he uses Grail Knights. It's so cool. So the Order Tide is legit getting in there to just try and rush down the undead in melee to grind them, which is insane. Usually fighting undead in melee is like is a, is a death sentence, like grinding with them. But like I'm really curious if this is going to be able to work. So we got Heinrich Kemmler. We do also have the White King here. We got Corpse Carts in the back and a lot of Tomb Guard. Yeah, very similar. Tomb Guard, Corpse Carts, Undead Healing. We got more Undead down here. A lot of those type of units. And let's see how this goes. Up on the high ground, the War Dancers are on their way in. We can do a little bit of fast forwarding while the army's kind of posture. Orion coming in, throwing spears. Look at that. Oh, the Hounds of Orion. Nukes one of the Tomb Guard right there. I love it. Yeah, that's pretty awesome stuff. And is he going to charge these Halberds? He is. They, they're not braced. Did they get there? Oh, I think they might have gotten the brace at the last second. See how they kind of held that charge like that? So he tries to pull through, but it didn't quite work out. Really good play there by Houseplant. But the other ones did get Grail Knighted. Oh, my God. I love his Grail Knight charges. Look how much damage they do. It's nuts. Like, these Tomb Guard half health. These Tomb Guard almost half health. Fane Chantress coming in, more descending them down now. The way they play this is just is just nutty. Like, I think what's going to happen is, I think the Order Tide's going to be playing the low ground. They're going to be playing 3 and 2. And, of course, threatening Objective 1. But, yeah, we see Orion, the Grail Knights, the Fane Chantress just, like, more descending shit down. We see the giant Forest Dragon. But, guys, remember, we saw the same thing happen last game. We saw the Bretonians get a really fancy start, but like then the undead were like, okay, enough games. And they started to like grind back and cause a lot of drama, right? Now, where's that forest dragon going to be going? Is it going to be trying to get a breath attack, perhaps? We do see the uh, war dancers battling into Tomb Guard. I actually do not know who wins this fight. I think war dancers, they just got that cost reduction and some buffs. 
So maybe Wardancers defeat Tomb Guard, which would actually be a really, really strong tech if they're able to win that. And yeah, Tomb Guard Halberds will definitely lose, but they're going to be getting the Narrow's Incantation of Protection there, which maybe salvages them. So Fane Chantress and Orion getting a little bit beat up. The problem is they're fighting in a bunch of Halberds here. So the Halberds are able to kind of hold it down. We got Wardancers on their way in. And if you were to lose like Fane Chantress and or Orion very early in this game, that would be very bleak. Um, Fane Chantress is getting really low, guys. Very, very low. She's actually potentially dying here, terrified. That is a rough start for the Order Tide, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the Lords. I mean, the Cavalry has been doing very well. War Dancers. It looks like the War Dancers, despite the lore passive from the Tomb Kings and the lore passive of the Undead also buffing them, uh, the Vampire Counts, the War Dancers are still winning. So that's a big tech change that seems to be working very well. So the War Dancer battling down the Tomb Guard Halberds, cutting them to pieces. Looking at the value so far, though, we see the Undead definitely cackling. But remember, but remember, all of the value that the Undead have is on Orion and Fane Chantress. The army value trading is most certainly going better for the Forces of Order. Most certainly. Orion going to be dropping the Hounds of Mel Gibson back here, unleashing them on the Nekar Warriors and the King Nikesh's Scorpion Legion. Random ass Bretonian Knights still like charging through things. Somehow some Knights ended up here on this side. And now we see the sneaky, sneaky undead, guys. Sneaky, sneaky undead coming over here. A skeleton Spearmen, as well as Warriors, all moving up towards Objective 3. What is the Order Tide going to response going to be? They cannot afford to lose these objectives. They really, really don't want that to happen. So there's going to be some Blade Singers coming out. I love the Blade Singer tech. A single Blade Singer from the Wood Elves can massacre all these units. All these units. No, this game isn't live. It's a replay. Yeah. Because um, you can't cast 2v2 live. It's too laggy. Creative Assembly won't give us peer to peer, so we have to suffer. But granted, replays, it, it's a totally viable system. I think, I think it's working out great. But so far, the real tale of the tape has been the War Dancers. I think the War Dancers, like, butchering the Tomb King's infantry, like, very effectively, has been awesome. And also, we have the Defenders of Flair to Lee doing some work. The Fane Chantress, is she back? It looks like she is. So the Fane Chantress also just sitting behind the good quality Wood Elf infantry, which is something you don't hear terribly often. And um, Mortis Engineering down all these units, which appears to be very, very strong. Now on the other side, Bretonian Knights coming in with a rear charge in the back, charging into the Grave Guard. And so far, the Undead have really, really been corralled uh, into this like high ground fight. They haven't been able to really kind of spread out over the battlefield, but that's starting to change. Skeleton Warriors coming out. We got Skeleton Spearmen. This objective looks like it's going to be flipping. And Skeletons are, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. We'll have to see how the capture weight unfolds here. Yeah, it looks like the capture weight is currently being, yeah, okay. So the Order Tide just barely maintains that capture weight here. Brutal charge from the Knights of the Realm, though. Like, he is not afraid of charging into Spears. If they're not braced, it's a good lesson that we're all learning here. I'm often so careful. I'm like, oh, I don't want to charge that Spear. It's, it's a Spear unit against my calf. And now you're about to see an absolute massacre. So the Whirling Death gives Blade Singers less armor piercing, but more uh, just overall anti-light damage. So these Blade Singers with 51 weapon strength, they basically have the DPS of Marauder Champions and are with a charge bonus of 54. They're going to be buzzsawing through these. And this objective should be held pretty efficiently. Tomb Kings over here, still moving with Nekar Horseman, going to be intercepted by the Grail Knights. Grail Knights get a really nice downhill charge. And we do see the Spell Singer of Life holding it down, providing three capture weight. Uh, an oversight from Creative Assembly is that Tomb King's um, Chaff Spearmen, the, the Vampire Counts one, ones only have two capture weight. They count as expendable. But for some reason, Creative Assembly did not apply that to the Tomb King Skeletons. So they actually have full five capture weight, which is one of the reasons why they were so strong before. High ground objective owned by the Undead. It's just a big, ugly grind up here. The Blade Singers are rocking 156 kills, but eventually they might get pushed back. Orion's still trying to hold. War Dancers holding. And honestly, I think most of these War Dancers have straight up killed the unit of Tomb Guard and continue to fight. But like, if you can hold the Undead to this high ground engagement, that's going to be very cost effective for you. So Bretonian Cavalry sweeping through the Skeleton Spearmans. Blade Singers, which is absolute buzzsaw. Look how quickly this Tomb Guard Halberd unit died to the Blade Singers. And it's like a multi-fight here. Look at the big Bretonian Cav Charge coming down from the high ground as well. The Order Tide fighting for the life of the old world if they lose this. And then the Undead will reign and the Era of Darkness will come in. But the Order Tide has taken up the mantle. The Wood Elves and the Bretonians stepping up where the other uh, Order Tide factions have failed and trying to stop the undead from taking over the old world here. So Blade Singer is coming down from the high ground. Another Blade Singer. I'm loving that we're getting to see elite Wood Elf infantry really being a solid carry. Of course, in tandem with beautiful, beautiful Cab Micro from the True Bretonian. They're both playing so well. Orion going to be pulling back here. It looks like he's getting a little bit beat up, but he's doing his job. You know, he's holding it down. He's occupying a lot of the enemy force. He's occupying a White King, a Zombie, a Grave Guard, Eyes of the Desert, Corpse Cart, White King. Like, they're all focused on Orion right now. And he's just... Holding it down here. 
but it does not look like the Order Tide's going to have an easy time getting this top objective. We do see that Grand Herald and Kotep got really beat up, so Orion must have gotten his clutches on Kotep at some point and almost killed him. But it looks like Kotep has survived, and was there some archer shooting or something? Oh, Sisters of Thorn? What the hell is this? Sisters of Thorn are out. Oh no, Orion's being hunted. He's being hunted by the White King. At this point, Orion, I think you just got to turn around and fight. Or have the Sisters of Thorn, like, tar pit and salvage you. But I think Orion could turn and maybe, maybe endure that because of his items. But the low ground objectives are taken under control. So we see two taken by the Order Tide and three taken by the Order Tide. The Cavalry and the Blade Singers able to kind of sweep all these guys. And we do see the Blood Knights now being summoned out. Blood Knights will be pretty good, but honestly, Blade Singers with their um, anti-armor profile on might actually like be able to put some hurt on them. We'll have to see. But Knights of the Realm, you know, with infantry support might also be able to do something. So now the Undead have finally secured their threshold on the high ground objective. We see a couple units for the Order Tide that needs to be unsummoned here, and the Undead are going to start moving down to objective two. Now, looking at the point lead, the Order Tide sitting at 668 to 424, so it's not that big of a difference. Um, either play, either team could win on a two cap right now, you know, if it were switching back and forth. Fan Chantress coming over here, dropping her Mortis Engine, and the Grail Knights get in there, and these Blood Knights got thundered. They got run over. Looks like these Blood Knights got Grail Knighted pretty hard, and I think what it is is it's the fact that Grail Knights have a charge bonus of 109. Chalice of Potions going down, clearing out some of the Halberds as well. And where are the Blood Knights? I want to see what their charge bonus looks like. Did they actually just all straight up die there? It looks like there's still a couple left. Um, Blood Knights, where are the Blood Knights at? Okay, um, there they are. So Blood Knights, a charge bonus of 72 against Bretonia, which has 109, which is pretty crazy. So yeah, a little bit of a differential there. Now, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of reinforcements coming in to support this objective in terms of War Dancers and Blade Singers. Low ground objective controlled by some Knights Errant from the True Bretonian. Definitely needs to unsummon those and or use them. But the Fae Enchantress is like hammer. Just the, the Grail Knights and Knights of the Realm. Just the Chalice of Potions nuking these Halberds. And just able to push back the undead. Blood Knights are in critical binding. These guys are weak binding. Like everybody here is looking kind of Palpatine. I'm too weak. Granted, the undead are persistent. Dire Pack, Cryptor is still on their way up. On the high ground, we do see the, oh my god, the Elven Infantry are still fighting here. These are the Elven Infantry from the early game, and they're still just going, and, like, the Undead are kind of looking a little bit empty here. If this Forest Dragon can kill the Corpse Guard, and, like, the remnants of these War Dancers could do something, the Wood Elves could easily summon, like, two Cav units as a surprise and seal this objective very, very quickly, which I think could potentially be what we're seeing. Because as of now, it looks like the Undead forces, the Blood Knights and the White King and all these, like, you know, uh, Tar Pitting Tomb Guard and company are just, just going balls deep for that middle objective. They're just coming for it. And the Bretonian Cavalry... Fighting well. Wood Elves do also have some Blade Singers active, and Blade Singers are just serving as lawnmowers this game. Uh, currently, these Blade Singers 1300 value, and the other ones are sitting at 700. Not bad. Um, they still have a lot of fight left in them, so I'm sure they'll be able to kind of accrue their value. The Bretonian Cavern, the low ground, going to be surging out. Most likely, they're going to be sacrificed into the spears, or you know they'll maybe kill the spears depending on how many how the charges are. But they're just trying to blunt the um, the reinforcements from getting here. So Lance is out for the lady, and they get in there. Howard Dean yell as they charge in, running down those skeleton spearmen, and then rushing over to intercept the Nehekara horsemen. See that? He tar pits like two advancing units to buy as much time on the objective as he possibly can. So Blade Singers fighting hard here, the other Blade Singers as well, but the undead might be able to kind of swing this one. We do see the Forest Dragon up here, able to take down the Corpse Guard, but a good response here from Houseplant. Mighty Champion of RTK does send his Tomb Guard Halberds up there to try and battle the Forest Dragon. And uh, more corpse guards, more undead coming in. Orion still just being a menace. Orion just being an absolute terror as he continues to push around and uh, route off these units here. We see skeleton warriors coming up for the high ground, looking at value trading right now. It uh, is pretty even, which, I mean, I know there's a lot of healing for the Order Tribe, but I can't help but think there's more healing for the undead. So they're going to need some big plays here for sure to wrestle this objective back. Currently, I, a two cap would be, I think, a victory for the undead, but it would be very, very close. It'd be very, very tight. So, um, you know, they want to get a little bit more comfortable if they can. Blood Knights get the Van Hell's Dance uh, Macabre here, and that's going to be giving them a melee attack against the Forest Dragon. Forest Dragon having a little bit of a problem, but the Defenders of Flair de Lee and the Spellsinger of Life might be able to kind of salvage that dragon. They're definitely going to need it. But these Blade Singers, again, almost 300 kills against the Undead, fighting with Knights of the Realm, might be able to kind of grind their way through this objective. We have 37 Blade Singers here. And the thing is, guys, these Blade Singers are killing a lot of the good quality infantry, like the high capture weight. And yeah, this is very scary as well. Good play here by Subatai. Using his White King to hunt down a very low Fae Enchantress is forcing a ton of micro out of those guys. But Orion up on the high ground is causing a lot of havoc. Are the Wood Elves going to go for anything here? We do see War Dancers coming out. So War Dancers going to be hustling for the high ground objective. Here we see the Forest Dragon continuing to do glorious battle with the Corpse Cart with the Unholy Lodestone. Able to grind down the supporting pieces. Knights of the Realm also battling Graveguard, but got to run away from the Halberds. Halberds are scary, but 
I think that the Order Tide might find a way to get this objective back, guys. With Orion up there, it looks like it could be the case. So the Undead tried to do a little bit of theft down here. Nakara Warriors, or Horsemen, as well as Spears, going for objective three on the low ground. But the Order Tide was able to respond with the Defenders of Flair de Lee and the Sisters of Thorn. It's so weird seeing them in battle. So I do not think the Undead is going to have success getting this objective. But the middle is firmly in the grasp, the cold, dead grasp of the Undead. It looks like they have that one under control. As Heinrich Kemmler has been really aggressive. Last game, he actually finished off Orion. This game, he's like chasing down the uh, Spellsinger here. Things are getting pretty crazy. Knights of the Realm versus a White King here. Eventually, the Knights of the Realm would win, but the White King has 110 armor, which makes him very finish, uh, tough to finish. And now we got War Dancers coming in with the Forest Dragons. Will the Undead be able to hold on to this high ground point? There is a little bit of a buffer for the Order Tribe, but not much. Absolutely not much. So Fane Chantress is going to be running. Heinrich could actually be in trouble here if these Knights of the Realm can get us around. And oh, man. Orion not going to get let anything happen to his wife. He's coming down the hill. The big man and Heinrich Kemmler could be in the danger zone. Oh, man, look at that. Okay, Heinrich finds a way out. That was very fortunate he didn't get surrounded there because Big Daddy was coming in for the kill there. And, uh, yeah, Orion and his White King are very wise to flee from the Wrath of Orion, who's currently sitting at 2,300 value. Now, as far as the high ground fight goes, War Dancers clearing out the Nakar Warriors. We do see some Tomb Guard Halberds as well as some Eyes of the Desert. Undead obviously have a pretty good stranglehold on this objective, but the Undead become a little bit weaker in some way when they have to like spread out over the battlefield. Undead really want to stay together and blob and get all those like buffs. That's just how their playstyle is. So when they're like forced to kind of play between these two objectives, it does give the more mobile factions an opportunity to maybe, uh, you know, pick some things off. War Dancers have been hands down one of the best units here, though. Uh, they clear those out. They also kill these Crypt Horrors. Here we do have the Defenders of Flare de Lee, who might actually end up losing this fight, but they are giving a little bit of buffering here. And I think there's some Bretonian Cav that definitely need to be unsummoned around the map. There's a couple of those. Middle objective still uh, being fought over. We do have the Forest Dragon with the Horn of the Wild Hunt trying to take down the White King characters. More Bretonian Cav and just like this fighting is so frenetic. It's just all over the place. Looking up here, we do see the War Dancers chasing down the Eyes of the Desert. And the Forest Dragon supporting. Forest Dragon has good armor piercing, so should be able to do some work. And this objective looks to be flipping back to the Order Tide, ladies and gentlemen. Looking at the score, currently 1,200 to 1,000. So we can see... The forces of evil, the undead, starting to get back in this game. But the double war dancers, I think, might be able to flip this objective. It's hard to say. There's a lot of undead coming in. But the thing is, the undead are losing all the grinding fights. Like, over here, they're losing it. And down here, they're also probably losing some of these grinds. Like, they seem to be kind of losing some of their army structure a little bit. Heinrich Kemmler is very damaged. There's still a dragon and war dancers. And the holy warden's here, too, guys. Here's the thing. This objective is going to be flipping as well. Somebody in chat saying, it's so over. Gotta hate vampires. Well, let's, we'll see about that, man. We'll see. You know, the first thing is you gotta you gotta put your faith in Sigmar, or in this case, the lady, and uh, hopefully they will salvage you. Downhill charge coming in, Grail Knights thundering through these units, just absolute brutal damage on the Cryptors. Forest Dragons broken, but the True Bretonians Cav really, really causing a ton of havoc. Now they're going to be getting into the Nakar Warriors here, crying, ha cry havoc, and let's slip the Dogs of War as we do see the Dire Pack coming in. Dire Pack maybe going to be going to the low ground, but overall it looks like the War Dancers able to fight off the Grave Guard, which is very, very impressive. Maybe the Bretonian Cab need to go help that low ground objective. But the middle looks like it could flip as well, guys. High ground is in danger of flipping. Currently, as it stands, it looks like it is going to be a double cap for the undead. The third objective, though, could be in danger. War Dancers with the uh, Shadow Coil active, 66 melee defense, able to fight these Graveguard very effectively. Now, that's something that I did not see happening here. So Grail Knight's coming across, and it looks like Bretonia is starting to get some teeth here in the middle. Though a lot of Halberds are coming in, which is going to be painful. Heinrich Kemmler falls. The Foul Necromancer has been taken down by the Bladesinger, so Whirling Death active. And here we see Cryptors and White Kings uh, in a little bit of danger as well. The Bretonian Cav here in the fourth quarter. They get a nice surround and really do quite a bit of damage to those guys. Now looking at the high ground, the Order Tide has taken it. The War Dancer push that we saw just massively outclassing the Undead uh, Infantry here. So the Undead Infantry that was sent to kind of deal with that just absolutely smashed. And Chad Ryan leading the charge. He's been fighting here the whole time. He's a huge armor-piercing character, and he can definitely take on the undead like infantry here. He's going to be able to help kill these Graveguard. Like, each of his attacks is definitely going to be putting a dent in them. Currently sitting at 2,600 value, which is quite nice. Okay. Order Tide is taking the high ground objective. Low ground objective looks like it flipped to the undead. The middle is owned by the undead as well. The Order Tide really needs to get an objective. They need to escape this double cap because it is getting very, very close. 1347 to 1288, ladies and gentlemen. As we do see the Grail Knights moving across, going after the Nehekara Horsemen. And uh, yeah, they should be able to butcher them pretty quickly. Orion moving in. High ground is very secure. 
There's three war dancers there, a fourth one with a little bit of Bretonian infantry support, a battle pilgrims, battle pilgrims, very, very awesome. Breath attack coming in from the high ground. All three objectives are looking like they could flip back to the order tide, ladies and gentlemen, as we do see the grave guard just being outclassed by the blade singers. Just absolutely outclassed. It's another, it's another tier of infantry. These blade singers are so cool. Yeah, they're able to cut through these guys like butter. Graveguard getting melted. This objective for sure is going to be flipping. Knights Errant able to deal with the dire pack. Got them on the charge, so that's going to be pretty decisive. Yeah, Car Horseman coming in. They'll buy a little bit of time. Currently looking at the score. Look how close it is. 1393 to 1380. What a close scrap. What a close scrap. But this objective is 100% going to be flipping, I think. A couple war dancers here are going to get cleaned off. And the capture weight should favor the Blade Singers as it is five against four capture weight. Really good play by Houseplant, though. He's like trying to push the infantry while keeping the capture weight alive. Although the Knights Errant, the Horn of the Wild Hunt, charge bonus of 108. They get in there, they do battle with the Nakakar Warriors, and the Houndos are finished off. This objective is going to be going to the Order Tide. The Order Tide just got past 1422, 1436. If the Order Tide gets a double cap soon, they might be able to get it. So this one is not flipping yet, and it flips. So the Order Tide will win if they manage to hold on. The middle objective is also being heavily contested. It looks like the Undead are able to kind of hold on to it. Eventually it will go to the Order Tide, but it's going to take some time. But I think the good guys have just barely done it. They have just barely done it. As we see more Knights Errant coming across, the Blade Singers just butchering everything, cutting through cavalry, infantry, they don't care. They're the honey batters of this game. And then the Lances come in. A little bit of a limp charge. They, they, they kind of got slightly confused, but ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be an order tried victory. All of you, all of you folks despairing in chat, doubting the power of the lady and uh, the demigod Orion. Well, there you go. So apparently the vampire counts can be beaten. The Vampire Count Tomb King comp can be beaten. It's been proven here today. And no excuses because Houseplant and Subatai are literally two of the best players in the entire world. So, so too are Kark and the True Bretonian, but, you know. It seems as if the Order Tide has gotten the W here. But they could still lose it. We're going to Game 3, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to Game 3. Really good matches on both sides. All these players, very, very strong. All right. So, let's get this party started. 1-1. One, one. As the Order Tide has brought it back, and now the fate of Middle-earth will be decided in this last game. Or the Old World. Whatever. You get the idea. Okay. So switching back to the brackets for a moment. We have Order versus Undead. The glorious, the glorious graphics that you guys all know and love. So that was Road to Vol's Anvil, and now we're on Border Low Landing for our next one. Okay. So, this is where the real weird mind games happen. Like, how are they going to switch it up based on this? Crimson, thank you. Thank you for the 20. Order Tide Melee Rush for the win. Hell yeah, all day. Chivalry is all. I'm excited for this match, man. There's the, all these players are so good. It's like, it's such a, such a treat to, to watch them trying to get this going. The War Dancers were big, but look at this, guys. Look at this. We have six Deepwood Scouts. What happened to the war dancers they clearly work super well but kark is going for the double mind game because he suspects that they're going to counter his war dancers somehow so he's switching it up this is risky man this is risky uh i didn't look at the war dancer value i should have but i'm just so excited for the next game that i uh, i'm sorry we can go back and look later if, we, if need be hmm. vampires and vampire counts could fit in destruction too yeah i got i got to rework the alliances a little bit i got to rework the alliances all right guys Swift Shiver Shards for the Order Tide. They do a shit ton of damage against Light Armor, though, guys. They do a ton of damage against them. So, taking a look at the Undead. We look at Houseplant. He pretty much has the exact same build, except he brought way more Halberds this time. I think he had less Halberds in his opening build last time. So, there is a minor change, but he's got Katep. We got Heinrich Kemmler. Skeleton Spears, Graveguard. Yeah, the builds are, are pretty much the exact same. The Undead, so confident. Perhaps thinking that last game was user error, that they uh, they didn't change anything. They just decided to bring the same build. I would wager he's got Blade Singers and Reinforcements, but he's going mass deep with Scouts this time, which is going to be really interesting. This is the Battle of Borderlow Landing. The Forces of Order sallying forth out of the city to battle the foul undead Dreadfleet, which has landed off their coast. No vampire. This is the Vampire Coast out here. The Vampire Coast dropped them off. They're like, you guys go do the heavy lifting. We'll just come in for the treasure afterwards. So pretty fun stuff. Pretty fun stuff. Orion is here. Deepwood Scouts. Grail Knights. So the True Bretonian has come in with the same build, basically. He's got Battle Pilgrims and the Fanchantress. 
And there is going to be a ton of Deepwood Scout Jack. I'm really interested to see how they do. I love how aggressive the True Bretonian is with this cap. It's it's so fun to see. This map, this map is interesting. There are Vanguard points in the side, so you can like pressure, pressure people's back objectives. I really, this is one of my favorite 2v2 maps, actually. Deepwood Scout shooting into the Halberds here. And yeah, it looks like they're methodically going to be shooting down the Halberds. So, yep. And Swift Shiver Shard's doing, like I said, really good damage. Even with Silver Shields being taken into account, they can definitely melt them. So the Undead don't like have any mobility either. Like it's literally just all infantry. So they're very much at the mercy of the shooting. And it looks like the sh shooting's going to be going over here, trying to melt down the Corpse Cart with the Only Holy Lodestone. Hey, HP Lovecraft, thank you for the donation. Any advice for Greece's Mortal Empires campaign in hard? Dude, I've never played an Ogre campaign. You're asking the wrong person. I'm so sorry I can't answer your question, but I literally have no idea. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. I greatly appreciate it. I've never played... Ogre campaigns, in my opinion, are pretty haggard, but... Grail Knights, like, one-shotting these spears. Those spears just get melted, man. It's so cool to see. And Orion and Fan Chanters, like, running around in this, like, Mortis Engine Goon Squad in just the DPS, and they, like, they break the bracing of these halberds, and then the rest of the halberds just get in there and do work. Corpse Guards being focused down here. So we do see the Corpse Guards being shot by all the Deepwood Scouts, and over here... Undead going to be sending some units to their back objective, but the middle objective is currently taken by the Order Tide at this point. And the Battle Pilgrims are going to be able to fight pretty well. Battle Pilgrims are a, a high DPS unit with good sustainability, for sure. As far as Bretonian standards go, I, I like them quite a bit. They're not like Chaos Warriors, but they do the job. Grail Knights, once again, the big Bretonian sandwich! Sandwiching those Tomb Guard Halberds. Just so much damage. Their HP just melting. And then they bounce over here and just hammer another unit of Tomb Guard. If you guys want to be a Bretonian god, this is this is kind of what you got to do. You got to be really, really rabid on switching your cab micro and just bouncing between targets. Looks like there's going to be a Chalice of Potions going down. Deepwood Scouts are actually doing a ton of damage. And in the backfield, we see the Cryptors getting run down. And these Grail Knights are just destroying everything they come into contact with. Like everything they charge into, man, it's just crazy, crazy stuff. And these Deepwood Scouts like aren't being threatened at all. It's just like the dreaded undead mouth breathing moving in. And I feel as if the value differential this game... Look at the value on True Bretonian, 28. Uh, you would think the Elves would have more, but his Cavern is doing so much damage. But will the Undead be able to break through the front line? We do see some crumbling. Tomb Guard getting melted here. Swift Shiver Shard still shooting in, trying to snipe Heinrich Kemmler a little bit, actually. Subutai with very, very good juking, so good control by Subutai. So he's able to kind of move those guys uh, side to side and avoid those shots. Knights of the Realm going to be squeaking around the side, looking for some opportunities to punish the flanks. We'll have to see. But overall, the Deepwood Scouts, man... Doing some solid, solid work. They're able to just kind of shoot unimpeded. The downside of Deepwood Scouts is how poor their range is. Um, but, you know, since they're able to kind of just sit and shoot everything they want to at this range, it's very, very good for them, for sure. Very, very good. All right. So, on the other side, we do see the old uh, Heinrich Kemmler battling the Knights of the Realm here. It's certainly not a fight that he's going to want to be taking here. And this fight's looking pretty good for the Order Tide so far, guys. True Bretonian with 4,800 value crushing everyone else in value. Dude, his Grail Knights and Knights of the Realm are just isolating good targets nonstop and just causing massive, massive havoc. And what's really cool about his playstyle is that it's very tough to emulate. Like, pretty much anyone can pick up, like, an Undead or Chaos Army and do well with it, but, like, picking up a faction like Bretonia and being a serious threat takes a ton of skill. Like, a ton of skill. So Defenders of Flair de Lee moving across, hammering those Skeleton Warriors down, who shot the summit of the backfield from the forces of the Tomb Kings. They're going to be back there chasing down those Glade Riders. Knights Errant intercepting, trying to protect a little bit. Chalice of Potions in the backfield. Huge Chalice of Potions. Both Tomb Guard getting crumped, and then some Grail Knights just come out of the shadows and start charging them, and then they bounce back the other way as well. So here they come. They're moving across. We don't see the Undead making any sneaky, sneaky plays through the woods. Really, really just taking this Wood Elf and Bretonian army head on. And it looks like they might start to get some capture weight here. We see some Warriors moving up. Battle Pilgrim's numbers are getting a little bit sparse. In the backfield, the Shafti Summon will be disappearing at about 9 seconds, give or take, although it is crumbling down anyways. So the Deepwood Scouts will be back online as well. And here we do see the Fane Chanters getting a nice Mortis Engine effect, draining down the King Nikesh's Scorpion Legion, while the Bretonian Cab are just rampaging. Dude, True Bretonian at 8.2. He has been possessed by Gilles Le Breton himself as he continues fighting and just running rampant with this cavalry. Here we see Heinrich Kemmler getting focused down. He got blasted. Really, really good play there by Kark, seeing the isolated Vampire Lord... Deepwood Scouts might get him. He's at 900 HP. Killing the Vampire Lord would certainly be cutting the head off the snake. That would certainly be the case. Looks like there's going to be a potential Chalice of Potions, some sort of witchcraft coming down here as the Bretonian Cavs rear charge into these units. Deepwood Scouts moving up, continuing to blast, and we do see the Dryads in the back as well. 
So Dryad's now going to be able to sustainably fight most of the Chaff units. Simon Benjamin, thank you for the 30. Love the format. Hard to bounce, I guess, but somehow achieves the epic feel of land battle. Yeah, it definitely does. It definitely does, Simon. Thank you so much. And um, it's honestly like... Yeah, there's some bounce issues, which we can work on via the Alliance system, but I think it's going to be fine. Like, people were saying that nobody could beat the Undead, and here we are with, with the Order Tide doing very, taking a game off them and potentially beating them. And, you know, they're equally skilled players playing, so, you know, it's, uh, it's all good. We'll make it work. Simon, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. Thank you for the pounds, brother. And we will uh, keep this battle going. Orion continues to fight here. A little bit trapped down by Graveguard, but he doesn't give a shit. He's fine. He's, he's going to keep dragging down the eyes of the desert. The Deep Wood Scout Focus Fire is really nasty, too. Kark is, like, methodically picking things off. And once again, Wood Elves have really good Light Calf. So they let the Bretonian handle the Heavy Calf so they don't have to use the Yemen and crappy things like that. The Glade Riders swarming across, blocking these units. Knights of the Realm also coming in. Great teamwork here from the Korean champions as we do see the Knights of the Realm protecting... The Deepwood Scouts in the backfield and more Glade Riders also able to intercept them. Now, will the Undead be able to get this objective? We did see the third objective actually being threatened. And is there going to be a threat back here? Are these Knights of the Realm going to go for it? The Undead Army might be getting a little bit thin. There's a big value difference. Granted, the Undead, of course, do have the like super overpowered healing. But I think there's enough of a value difference that it's not making up for that for sure. So Grail Knights once again charging back into the middle. We do see the Fan Chantress going to be dropping the Mortis Engine. Deepwood Scouts, still very healthy, and, man, and a lot of ammo on those units, which is certainly very uh, troubling for the Undead. The Undead seem to be running out of steam a little bit up on the point. We do have uh, some decent quality infantry via Battle Pilgrims and, uh, and Dryads, and a lot of Bretonian Cavalry just sweeping all over these positions and causing a ton, a ton of havoc. So here we do get the Knights Errant. Knights Errant uh, able to hold back the Cryptors, as well as some Blood Knights, obviously going to be sacrificed for the Lady. But I do really think that Bretonia could maybe just take this back objective. But they're more focused on value trading, which I think is smarter at this point. You know, if, if you get greedy and try and go for three objectives, you could give your opponent an opportunity to kind of get their way back into this game here. So Deepwood Scouts still getting some work done. Shooting into the eyes of the desert here. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of Deepwood Scouts. There's still six of them. Very, very functional. I would imagine they've all gotten pretty good value. So Tomb King's making a little bit of a desperate play to try and shut down the shooting here with their horsemen and... And Grand Herofrent Kotsep's even coming in on that party, but I don't think it's going to work out. As Chad Gibson just skewering down these undead, and the Fane Chantress draining down anything that gets in their way. You can see her drain. I would wager she's up over 2,000 value right now. Yeah, 1,500. Pretty close. Orion's probably over 1,500 also. Yeah, only 1,000. He'll get there eventually, especially when he kills some of these Cryptors. Back objective not being contested. We have some Tomb Guard Halberds, which apparently chased something off the edge of the map. And the Tomb Kings did temporarily push the missile units off the objective, but it looks like the Wood Elves are going to stabilize. They have all their Glade Riders here. Deep Wood Scouts are all pretty healthy. Honestly, not a lot of the missiles even got that beat up. And now Kotep's in a little bit of danger. Oh, old man, you're in the wrong neighborhood. You're in the wrong neighborhood. Orion's coming for you. Kark going to give it to you. So here it comes. Orion with the steel chair in the back. You see absolutely brutal damage. And yeah, like, Kotap's going to get wrecked. Like, assuming he doesn't get some mass to protect him, Orion should just kill him here. And uh, Houseplant will not be able to unsummon him. It looks like Knights of the Realm coming across to help. Middle objective, uh, slightly being taken by the undead, but I think it's just because the character has kind of moved off to do other things. We see a Mortis Engine coming in from Subutai. Um, not a bad choice, but at this point, I don't know if it's going to help too much. I think the Swift Shiver Shards will probably be able to just pick it off. And is Orion giving it to him? It looks like he is. So he hasn't hit him too much. It's always annoying to hit foot characters, but Orion should definitely stay the course there and finish him off. It's going to be a big penalty for the Tomb King's leadership if uh, Kotep does die. So Kotep calling in some help. Grail Knights are hot on their tail, though. So Grail Knights will be able to dispatch them. Kotep sitting at 2,000 HP. It looks like he's been able to get... The whole thing of like units getting knocked over in this game instead of taking damage is so silly. They really need to fix that. Acro, thank you. This might be my new favorite format, Amazing Games. Hey, thank you so much. We'll be doing it all the time. We can do this once a week. Shit, it's a lot of fun. Thank you, thank you. And Orion, bumping and grinding, man. Kotep's still trapped up. He gets his help. But yeah, Kotep finally took some damage. It looks like the Grail Knight's got the job done. He's going to try and unsummon him here. Yeah, he's, he's going to run Kotep away, and then Houseplant's going to unsummon him as soon as he possibly can. Maybe, or maybe he keeps him on the battlefield. That'd be pretty greedy. Order Tide's middle objective was looking in danger, but fear not. The, the, the sons and daughters of Bretonia will be your shield. So we get the Knights Aaron in there clearing out all the filthy undead chaff. And as somebody who's made Empire my entire life, uh, it certainly brings me, uh, brings me joy. My entire lifespan in this game. It brings me a lot of joy seeing the undead being uh, punished. Granted, I mean, I'm friends with all these players, but you know, undead are always fun to root against. Up on the high ground, Grail Knights with the Horn of the Wild Hunt. Charge bonus of 125. They're not in Lance Formation, but still going to be pretty devastating. 
Kotep is getting hunted down. The Spellsinger, charge bonus of 54. 1,207 HP. Yeah, she gets a nice little uh, Dragon Ball Z attack there, and Kotep will eventually die to that character, 100%. Deepwood Scout's going to be putting on the icing on the cake here. I don't know if he's paying attention, but they do take quite a bit of damage. And Kotep is going to be going down here. There it goes. All right. Good night, Sweet Prince. He's at 300 HP. Should start crumbling. I'm surprised he hasn't. It looks like one last incantation of protection going down as the Tomb King's Lord is going to be falling. And that's going to be a big penalty for the entire Tomb King's army. Negative 16 leadership means they'll crumble a lot easier. And it looks like the Order Tide has taken over. 16 and 9 against 10 and 10. So pretty big difference, but a healing, the healing might bring it a little bit closer. But remember, the Order Tide has healing too. So they're able to kind of dispatch some of those as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that's going to be a victory for the forces of good. They have uh, saved the old world from the villainous hordes of chaos and the despicable vampire counts and tomb kings. Certainly something that we, uh, well, tomb kings, yeah. We're just going to kind of throw them in with the vampire counts because it's all good. But und somehow the undead are catching up on value, just like Palpatine returning in Star Wars, yes. Uh, the Mortis engine in the middle is doing well. Knights of the Realm doing their thing. But at this point, it's very much a situation where the Order Tribe could probably win on one objective and the undead are more of like a slow push. I don't think they're going to be able to deal with the cab keeping them off the objective. Subutai coming in with a lot of, you know, chaff units. He's got Graveguard and Zombies. But huge, huge Order Tide charge. Oh, yeah. We've got to give him the, the Howard Dean intro as they get in there. Big, big charge right there. Zombies being sent back to the shadows. This is what we all live for. Sent back to the water. Driven back to the water here, which is very, very glorious for sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Middle objectives being held. Orion can easily deal with the Mortis Engine. He could just chase that. We have the Swift Shiver Shards coming back online. Kark has had excellent Archer Micro this game. Let's not forget that. True Bretonia has obviously been a huge MVP this game. Like, Bretonia is not easy to play. They're not easy to play. It's very high micro, but, you know, he's done it, man. He's done it. Looking on the other side, we do see Objective 3 being held. The reason why Kark is uh, banking 3,000 resources is because he has nothing else to summon, probably. Um, he brought a very elite army of archers and hasn't needed to unsummon them, so that's why he's banking that. Which is one of the reasons why, yeah, he, some of the Glaive Guard Sarfire Shafts came back on. It looks like they might have been on cooldown, but now he's gotten them back. Middle objective is just rock hard held for order. That is going to be it. There's no way the Undead are going to win this. Um, order Tide has Orion. They have the Fame Chantress. A lot of crazy stuff here. Knights Errant chasing down these Cav who are trying to ninja the back objective. And we can do a little bit of fast forwarding as this game closes out. We'll give you guys like a cinematic ending here. Undead trying to get there. Mortis Engine being killed by Archers. The Glaive Guard just tearing apart that unit there. And the points are ebbing further and further away from the clutches of the undead. As the Mortis Engine is going to be dragged through the dust by all those wood, uh, elven archers. Which is very, very cool. And uh, yeah, Orion going to be finishing the job. Krell has been summoned. Look at the, the demigod. Making Krell look like a, like a pup here. He's just a giant beast. Elven archers coming in to finish the job. Taking down the Mortis Engine. Sealing the deal. And the Bretonian Cavalry one last time for the lady. At the Horn of the Wild Hunt active. Running down the skeletons. And that is going to be GG well played. The beacons have been lit. Warhammer Rohan has answered. So too has Warhammer uh, Mirkwood in this grand final fight. And the true Bretonian and Kark are going to be the first champions of our Warhammer 3 Grand Alliance series. Congratulations to them. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And man, I can't thank you guys enough for all of your generosity today. Thank you so much for the donations. All of you new members. It really helps out a lot. Um, January and February are always really bad for this for this stuff. So it, it helps out so much. I can't, I can't explain it to you guys enough. So... Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, guys. Crazy, crazy builds. The Deepwood Scouts, let's look at the value. 14, 14, 12, really solid. And then he had a bunch of Glade Guard. Okay, he had a bunch of archers, wow. The True Bretonian, all right, let's look at it, guys. 4,100, 3,500. So he is the true Lord of the Grail Knights. That's just the true master of the Grail. 37, 17, 12, man. I honestly think like 2v2 is more fun to watch in Domination than 1v1. I, I like, it's so fun. Although I wouldn't feel that way if it was like non-lore friendly. Like if it was, if it was just like, you know, random faction versus random faction, because here we can get behind like order or undead or chaos. Whereas like, if it's like traditional 2v2 where you just pick whatever you want, you can't really like get behind something and it's hard to tell what's happening. But here it's obvious. You see good units, you see, you see undead units, whatever, right? So that was a lot of fun. But guys, thank you so much. I, uh, I can't thank you guys enough. It's insane. So many, so many huge donations. Cass, dude, all of you, thank you. And we'll be back 
There's a lot of good games today. A couple of Chaos Mirror matches earlier. I'm really excited to see what people scheme, and I hope that Kark and True Bretonian come back to defend their crown. Because I want to see that sweet, sweet Bretonian Cab Micro coming. The Bretonian player already has a unique Bretonian picture. I can't reward him anything for this. I can't. Although I'm, I'm kind of tempted to give Kark a, a Orion one. I don't know. We'll see. I'll talk to him about it. All right, guys. <laughs> King of the Dead 24 hour shirtless hot dog stream. The only time you would actually get like anything close to a haggard shirtless stream would be if I, um, once I get like more practice at jujitsu, I might like film some of the, I, I want to do some competition. So yeah, I would like film that. That could be fun. Value from the last game. Yeah, at this point, I think I think it was it was probably pretty high. Yeah, I'll put the replay in Discord, and uh, if you want to take a look, we can. All right, guys, that's it. GG, well played. I cannot thank you guys all enough for your donations. There were so many generous ones, dude, and we got eight new channel members, which is a ton. We're uh, we're making some good progress on reaching our uh, our February goal. So thank you guys. Really, really appreciate that. And we'll see you on the other side. I'll be back um, sometime soon. The stream has ended. The order tide is won. We need to make it official with our really shitty bracket. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Okay. The order tide has done it. GG, well played. Take care of yourselves. Congratulations to our winners and to all the players who played today. Well played to Subutai and Houseplant as well. Putting on a great show. And you know, somebody's got to play the villain and it had to be them. So uh, we'll see you guys. Take care of yourselves. That's it for tonight. And uh, we'll close it all out with some glorious Britannian soundtracks. GG.